Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today's the first Monday of the month, which means it's time for Monday with the McDougals. And today, Dr. John McDougal is going to be discussing NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and hopefully answering a few of your questions as well. Please welcome him to the show. How are you today, Dr. McDougal? I'm uh, I'm, I'm doing fine. I mean, good grief. I uh, had a Two hours with you yesterday afternoon. <laughs> and I will do it last evening at five o'clock. You know, we do it every every Sunday evening, five o'clock. Mary and I and Heather get on and we answer questions. And we do we do a little a little topic too. And that's every Sunday night, 5 p.m. Pacific time on our YouTube channel. So I was there last night, and now I have the privilege of being with you today. And because your audience is so much larger than our audience. I thought I would uh, uh, discuss fatty fatty liver disease like I did last night, but maybe in some more detail. You know, I, I, likely the things I talked about, you have to hear more than once. Yeah, you know, good, good. One of my mentors, one of my friends, uh, was Henry Heimlich. You know, the Heimlich maneuver. He was a mm -hmm. personal friend of mine. Uh, he saved more lives than anybody has ever walked this planet with the Heimlich maneuver and the Heimlich chest valve. The time of chest valve is uh, like a, a little flapper, you know, how the, those balloons, you know, you know, flaps like that. Okay, that's all it is. It's just a little piece of, of metal or wood and then a balloon off the off of the back of it so that it flaps closed. Okay, air will go out, but it flaps closed. And so what they do with men on the field, war right now, today, and I'm sure it's happening in some hot pots in the world. Whenever people get injured in the chest, the chest will be, it's open. And, you know, you require the muscles of the of the uh, chest to expand the lungs so that you breathe. So you're effectively have completely spoiled the lung function on the side that has uh, been exposed to battlefield air. Okay, so what, what Henry Heimlich did is he invented this way. You know, millions of these things have been used where he takes it, you know, close up the wound, okay? You got to get it closed. And then you take this, uh, stick this uh, Heimlich chest tube in another spot, okay? And then every time this person takes a breath, they blow air out of the chest cavity and slowly expand the lung. Save, you know, millions of lives. Anyway, that's Henry Heimlich, but that's not what I was going to tell you. What I was going to tell you is that Henry Heimlich taught me a few things in life. Um, he said, one thing he said, John, he said, uh, They'll never give you a platform. <laughs> You're going to have to run around them. And, you know, it's been that way, too. They, they've they never offered me a platform. They don't want to discuss diet therapy and the failure of present medicine, because, you know, I hit them hard. I don't want to do that. So I have the shows like Chef AJ's show and other opportunities where I get to run around them. <laughs> the other thing that Henry Heimley taught me is he said that if all people understand what you're saying, you're not being creative enough. That's interesting. I think, I think a lot of times, you know, like the liver discussion last night, is that I don't think very many people really grasp the whole thing. So I still am on the edge of being creative enough to present you new material, new diseases, thinking things. And we've been doing this for like, I don't know, probably since uh, probably 30, 40 years. I never seem to fall... Uh, uh, fail to find new subjects. And of course, every Friday night, what we're going to do is, uh, or Saturday, Sunday night, excuse me, Sunday night, five o'clock Pacific time, YouTube channel, McDougal, is I'm going to present, I've got this whole library. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a library of like a thousand of my favorite papers. You know, all, all the way from Alzheimer's disease to zits. I've got, I've got like thousands of papers in my, on my computer. PDF files, the original scientific papers. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with A, probably. And I'm going to go down the list alphabetically. And I'm going to talk to you about things like, you know, breast cancer and colonoscopies and, uh, you know, fatty infiltration of the liver. We'll get to the Fs. But that's, that's what I plan on doing to, to keep the, the, the show fresh. And also what I'm going to do, you know, a lot of these articles date back 20 years. Some more, some, you know, I got them from before I was born. What I'm going to do with these opportunities is when I make new slideshows 
or I talk about it on the five o'clock or on this, this opportunity I have with you guys this morning, I always provide the references. So you can look it up. You can see that I'm not exaggerating. I, I, I've told the story truthfully. And uh, anyway, that's what we're going to do to keep the, but I'm going to add the new references. Like, for example, fatty, fatty, fatty liver. I've been studying fatty liver for probably 50 years. There were some new articles that came out that I thought would add to the presentation. So as you watch the presentation, you'll see in the bottom right-hand corner, the references from 2021, 2022, 2023, and probably the earliest I go back is 2020. Just, just to handle those critics who say, oh, your research is so old. Hey, the truth don't change. And if I told you the truth 20 years ago, and the research says otherwise, I'm going to enlighten you. I'm going to tell you I made a mistake. I didn't understand this. That hasn't happened yet. But, you know, great possibility it will. And I hope that I'm right there to admit to you that um, you know, I had a lot to learn. Anyways, it's nice to have the new references. And so anybody who says to you, oh, that McDougal, he's back in the 1940s. He's in the 50s. He's old stuff, man. We got this all figured out in the 21st century. You don't have to worry about that old stuff. Hey, people were smart in the old days, too. In fact, they did better experiments because they didn't have the influence of the drug and pharmacologic industries. You know, since 1980, with deregulation of the money, researchers haven't been able to get money from the government as easily as they did before. So where do they get it from? You know, they got to put they got to put shoes on the baby, pay for the tuition. Where do they get the money from? If the government won't give it to them in grants. And do you think that these people have any influence mm -hmm. on how the research is published? You bet, 70%. It's been documented in Public Library of Science. Uh, Public Library of Science 1, actually, is where the article is. That 70% of the research that, that is presented in the National Library of Medicine is sponsored by either the food or the drug industries. So anyways, if you look at older research, you don't have that influence because this didn't happen until 1980. I mean, scientists made uh, their research projects based upon trying to understand things, not trying to sell a product, which is what they do now. You know, they start out with a research uh, project in mind, and the goal is to prove this supplement or that food or whatever is particularly good for you. And we get it published in the advertising section of the journal, which happens to be where the articles are in the center. That's the advertisements. It's the research that these companies pay for, and you fall for it. I know your doctors do. I know your doctors do. Oh, just show me a study. Oh, just show me. Well, let's show me a good study, like a randomized control study. Let's do that. <laughs> let's be honest. Anyway. Okay. So uh, I was going to get on. Uh, last night, I talked about a couple of things that I'll just mention to you. One is I talked about how the, um, the the infant mortality rate has doubled in this country in the last couple of years, last 10 years. It was in the New York Times. Uh, infant mortality was, I, I believe, 3.4% of the infants born are dead, uh, particularly in whites and in Native Americans, which was a little surprising for me because it used to be blacks had the higher incidence of uh, infant mortality, and maybe they still do. It just didn't look at it. But I can see where the whites with their enthusiasm towards fattening foods <laughs> would fit into this category. And also I can see that Native Americans, and I'm, I'm gonna generalize here, Native Americans have had fewer opportunities for education, advancement, et cetera. So they're less informed about important subjects like what do you eat when you're pregnant? Of course, if I was there on, on uh, some type of land of uh, Native Americans visiting their community, you know what I'd say? What would I say? What would I tell these uh, Native American people? What would I tell them? I'd tell them to eat like grandma and grandpa. You know, eat like eat like Native Americans of 100 years ago or 12,000 years ago where they lived on four corners potatoes. Four corners potatoes, you know, those four states that fit together in the Southwest United States. They kind of fit together in corners, four corner potatoes, right? They were eating those 12,000 years ago and they were eating corn. So, yeah, I wouldn't hit them with a vegan diet or vegetarian diet or whole food plant based, whatever, whatever the acronyms you're using these days. No, no, this is this is can't relate to this. People can't relate to this. 
this is some kind of a foreign national, an enemy government, these, these vegans are. They're out to ruin our lives. So don't talk to them that way. Don't talk to them about a vegan diet. Talk to them about how, how grandma and grandpa used to eat. Oh, you know, I come from uh, I don't know, Central America or Mexico. And God, grandma and grandpa, they were hard working in the fields at 90. And they let them eat some rice and squash. Or well, grandpa and grandpa, you know, they're out there tending the garden in, in their 90s. And, you know, they were raised in, in Thailand. And they brought their rice-based diet with them when they came 70 years ago. Well, how are they doing? Well, anything they want in their 90s. Well, you ought to emulate the diet that has given your ancestors such great personal appearance and health. Now, if you can't go back that far, like, you know, I'm, I'm a, a, a white guy. It's been around for a couple hundred years in, in the Midwest United States. So, you know, I can point back to the Irish. Yeah, I can. Sure, I can. And what are the Irish noted for as far as they're eating? Well, of course, potatoes. So anyway, I would like you to convey the message that way the best you can. The science is there. I'm providing it for you in the past and current. And if you think that any of my stuff is outdated, you let me know. My email address is up there. You let me know. And I'll do what I can to, to come up to date. All right, let's see what we got here. Um, are, we doing, are we doing okay here? Yeah, we're doing great. I, you're, if you're trying to share screen, nothing has showed up yet. Oh, uh, yeah, I know. I'm trying to. Okay, we're going to get going here. All go. right, I think this will do it. Okay, the liver. The liver is in... Uh, I love that squirrel. <laughs> the, the liver is in the right upper quadrant of your abdomen. So like right, right up here below your lung. And it's a big guy. It's, it's, you know, it's a liver. You've probably seen livers from slaughterhouses. You know how big they are. Anyway, the liver's job is to detoxify uh, chemicals that you have to take in in your diet. And also it clears up the blood, cleans it up, and takes care of dead red blood cells and other dead cells. And it makes bile acid for digesting fat. That's what the liver does. Well, the liver becomes inflamed the same way that your body fat, the adipose tissue, that stuff hanging from your belly, your buttocks or your thighs, you know, that body fat. It becomes inflamed similar to body fat, except body fat is more designed to take these fat overloads. I'm good grief. These are, these are cells that their purpose is, is to stuff them full of with fat. You realize as you don't get older, as you get older, you don't grow new cells. You don't grow new fat cells. You just take the ones that you were born with and you stuff them fuller with fat. Anyway, fat cells can tolerate all this fat better than other body cells go. But the liver, it gets stuffed with fat too, just the same way. Insulin forces fat into fat cells and into all kinds of cells in the body. Forces glucose into the, into the cells in the body too, it does both. So anyways, you get this fat stuffed in the liver and uh, you develop some insulin resistance. In this particular slide, they talk about how they believe that fatty infiltration of the liver also involves damage to the pancreas. I don't know that that's the case, uh, except that may be more likely than if you have type one and a half diabetes, you are a sicker person and uh, you, know, you could, uh, I guess you could blame it on on losing some pancreatic function, but it's not necessary. You can explain the whole thing by uh, by insulin resistance, the, the body's cells becoming, becoming resistant to insulin. So you make more insulin and stuff more fat into fat cells. Anyway, uh, type two diabetics have twofold the increase in developing non-alcoholic, let's go through these letters, N-A, non-alcoholic, that's what it stands for, N-A. That means that when you start out your question with somebody who has liver problems, is you start out by asking, do you drink alcohol? If they do, then you should suspect the alcohol is the most obvious thing. But this is non-alcoholic. Non-alcoholic, that's what NA stands for, non-alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease. Now, the way you first see this is you get a blood test back, and on that blood test, you've got a bunch of stuff, cholesterol, creatinine, BUN, blood sugar, but you also have a whole series of liver function tests. Uh, SGOT, SGPT, 
ALT and AST, and uh, oh, there are a couple others. Anyway, there are some inflammatory markers of liver disease that go up. And so you get this blood test back and you go, my goodness, look here, my liver tests are up. What could be the problem? I don't drink. I'm, I'm very overweight. And I got type 2 diabetes. Well, when you do some further testing, like we might have a biopsy done of your liver, that's very dangerous. Don't do that. Unless they're absolutely necessary. Or you can do a sonogram or a CAT scan of the liver and you can see the fat. So anyway, this uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is just inflamed liver tissues, no permanent destruction, no scar tissue. You have to wait until you've had decades of disease and inflammation. And eventually what happens as the, as the process of healing goes takes place, the inflammatory process, is you end up having scars. Scars, you know, fibrous scars, dead tissue, well, not dead, inactive tissue. Fibrous scars replace the normal liver cells. And so you end up losing your liver function. And we call that condition cirrhosis. You can get cirrhosis from alcohol. You get cirrhosis from fatty infiltration of the liver. Same, same, same cirrhosis. You know, same loss of liver function. Same, same problems you run into, whether it's caused by alcohol or fat. So if you've got additional problems with alcohol and additional problems with eating a high-fat diet. Anyway, uh, that's how you get it. It's it's no more complicated than that. You just get over fat, and fat goes <clears throat> all through your body. You know, on your neck. You remember the double, triple, quadruple chin? Okay, ears. Ears seem to get fat on some people. Uh, you know, your buttocks, your thigh, your abdomen. You you stick all this fat. When I used to be in surgery, now I met, most of you know that I spent my four years in medical school. Uh, 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 working as a surgical tech. I, I was a surgical nurse. I, every day I went in on somewhere between four and 10 operations a day, handing instruments to the doctors. Of course, I got a bird's eye view to say the least of the inside of the abdomen. We always used to laugh when somebody had to have this great big fat filled abdomen. I remember, you know, somebody, oh boy, look at this. Look, oh, look who's coming out. Of well, watch me slice this belly open and see what comes flopping out. Big old minimum full of fat. Of course, they got fat on the thighs and the hips, and they got fat every place. There's nothing special about this. All right. So um, anyway, this is a look at look, good, look, good looking healthy liver and a fatty liver. And uh, research, if you look at it, says the treatment of the vegan diet is best. And I'll tell you why it's best in, as we go on. Uh, try, efforts have been made to substitute one kind of fat for another. For example, in this experiment, they use olive oil and fish oil supplements. And they find that neither one of them improves fatty infiltration of the liver. When well, you switch animal fat to, to vegetable fat or to uh, monounsaturated fat, olive oil. The fat you eat is the fat you wear in your liver, regardless of what kind of fat it is. You know, remember I told you many times I can take... I can take a needle, I can stick it in your buttocks, thigh, or abdomen, I can suck out the fat. I can take it to the lab and I can analyze the fat and I can tell what you like to eat. If you like olive oil, you'll be full of monounsaturated fats. You like uh, you like uh, Crisco's and margins, you'll be full of trans fats. You like fish, fish oil, you'll be full of omega-3 fats. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. Why not? I mean, what do you expect? Anyway. Uh, you end up wearing olive fat and uh, fish fat in the liver, doesn't decrease the inflammation. So in other words, you got to get rid of all the fats in the diet to correct this problem. Okay, low carb diets. If you do a literature research, and I just did one before we started on the show, because, because I had some questions in my mind. You see whether or not a low carb Atkins type carnivore, a keto type diet, will correct fatty infiltration of the liver. And it does. Anything that causes weight loss causes fat to come out of your body fat and your liver fat. So low-carb diets, they advertise, are effective at treating because of the weight loss. Some of these articles have tried to invoke some special thing about the fat that they use. And, you know, how, I don't know. It, it's just nonsense. It's the weight loss that 
results in the fat, more fat coming out than going into either your body fat or your liver fat. Anyway, you can do it with a low carb diet. Why don't you want to do it with a low carb diet? Here are four major reviews. You should memorize these. You should get these studies. They're all free on the internet. Anybody that comes up to you and says they're on a low carb keto Atkins uh, carnivore kind of diet, show them these. these. These these are review studies that looked at multiple studies. Animal low carb score was associated with higher all cause mortality. Low carbohydrate diets used on a regular basis are associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease. I mean, where do I have to read the dangers of these things to you? Low carb diets were associated with a significant higher risk of all cause mortality. These are, these are some of our best journals in the world. PLOS1, British Medical Journal, Annals and Tournaments, Journal of the American Heart Society. These are the best medical journal, most respected, you know, highest impact factor of any published periodical that there is. And, and they give you four reviews of other studies and they all come to the same conclusion. These diets will kill you. Anyway, they also make you sick, put you into ketosis. But anyway, they, they look at the dates on these studies, 2010, 2012, 2013. I put them in, in chronological order, 2014. You say, well, don't talk to McDougal. This is 18-year-old research. It just can't be true. I'm sure they figured out that eating all those pigs and cows is good for you. 2023 just came out. Uh, a guy named Merkley. I don't know whether you know him or not. He's a... He's a, a, a blogger who's been around for 20, 30 years. And I haven't had much contesting with him, but a little bit. He was a strong promoter of low-carb diets. Okay. And uh, and as a, a result, you know, he told people to eat the Atkins diet all these years. Well, Merkola, Merkola, M-E-R-C-O-L-A, is that a change of heart? It was because of this study that came out in 2023 in the Journal of Internal Medicine. Low-carb diets, low-fat diets, and mortality in middle-aged and older people. Hey, that's me. That's me. That's you women, too. Middle-aged and older people. And what they found is if you're on a healthy diet, you have an 18% reduction in risk of dying, as opposed to an 18% increase in risk of dying. It's even worse, actually. More cancer, more heart disease, more death. There's no research. There's no studies. There's no uh, meta-analyses. There's no conglomeration of studies that shows in any way does a starch-based high-carbohydrate diet cause these problems. The kind of diet that we follow causes us to have less cancer, less heart disease, and to live longer. Plain and simple. Regardless of how boisterous these people are, Reminds me of politics. Anyway, uh, then, of course, you can take the new shots. There's a whole bunch of shots. Mary said she didn't didn't notice all these different names for these shots. But they're all derived from the Gila monster venom. Gila monster is a reptile that lives in southwest United States. And when that little fellow bites you, oh, you lose weight. Well, only for a couple of minutes. Because the poisoning only lasts a couple of minutes. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Hey, where else do you hear about nausea, vomiting, diarrhea? Oh, you read the product inserts on these drugs. And they tell you that the, the desired side effect is nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. They work by making you sick, by causing you to have some derivative of reptile poisoning. What they did is they took the venom and they just manipulated the molecular structure to make the poisoning last for a day or a week. And then they sell it to you as products, such as Mongero and Ozempic. And... <clears throat> okay, so you can buy drugs. Let's, let's see some of the downsides of buying all these drugs. Uh, here's, here's the Gila monster. A cute little guy, isn't he? Anyway, it, it's the lower jaw that has the venom. And he only clamps on you for a couple of seconds and then he lets go. But... Look at the side effects. The bite, bite from the Gila monster is swelling, intense burning pain. You'd expect that from a bite, wouldn't you? Vomiting, dizziness, weakness, rapid heart rate, high blood pressure, faintness, excessive perspiration, chills, and fever. Yeah. The problem with trying to cure fatty infiltration of the liver 
by this means of weight loss. Remember, any means of weight loss will cause the fat to come out of the liver. Why not? The fat leaves. So look at these are the studies. This is representative of what happens uh, when you take these Ig uh, GLP-1 agonists, Ozempi, et cetera, Manjaro, et cetera, Wigovi, et cetera. What happens is this. This is an actual chart from, from one of the research papers. And what you see is the light gray line, gray line up there is, uh, is the uh, placebo, the control group. Okay, the control group got instructions to reduce the calorie intake by 500 calories a day and to exercise. And you see by that recommendation, light gray line, that the control group got a, uh, you know, about a two, three percent reduction in weight over the period of time that lasted uh, 68 weeks. And then you see the dark, the dark uh, line, which is the GLP-1 agonist. You know, Zempic. And you see a really nice drop in weight. Looking at the percent of body weight that reduced to 2%, 4%, 6%. It finally get out to about 20%. 20% of your body weight, that's a lot of pounds, but not that much. It's only 37 pounds when you look at their baseline. See the bottom left-hand corner? This is the baseline. This is the baseline weight that they started with. So if you started with a 233-pound on average weight in these subjects, and you figure out what their weight loss is, which you find is they've lost 37 pounds in 68 weeks and it cost them $17,000. And then the weight loss stops. Why does it stop? Because your body wants to survive. You see, you've got this chronic reptile poisoning. Go on. Okay, it's going on. It's, it's keep, keeping your appetite low, keeping your, your uh, uh, food intake low. It's giving you nausea and diarrhea and vomiting. How are you supposed to feel good about eating when you suffer from diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting? Huh? They, they, they talk about this, this, this constant song of hunger that keeps going on and this shuts it off. Well, no, it makes you sick. That's what happens. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Anyway, the body says, okay, we get down here to 68 weeks. All right, you know, you've lost some weight. But body, if you don't do something, you're going to die. And so and what happens is it finally gives up. It won't undergo any further weight loss. It goes on to a plateau at 36 weeks and you stop losing weight. And all the studies done, they reach a plateau. You lose no more weight after 36 weeks. But if you stop the drug, you'll regain your lost weight. Now, is that the way you want to cure fatty infiltration of the liver? All right, you can uh, have various bariatric surgeries. You'll lose weight. Any reason you lose weight. Or, 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 it doesn't matter. Just stop eating. Have your teeth wired together. Uh, infect yourself with, uh, uh, with various bacteria and amoeba that make you chronically sick with nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Hey, maybe we can get a new drug, which would be the toxins from Shigella bacteria. I bet they've tried that, the drug company that tried that. You know, Shigella bacteria make an extremely potent toxin. I bet you could get, I bet you could get uh, two or three times the weight loss and probably delay the plateau by giving them Shigella toxin. That's, that's, that takes me back a few years, but I'm pretty sure Shigella is a very poisonous bacterial toxin, which is probably really good for weight loss. Anyway, or you can lock yourself up in prison. I don't care how you stop eating, you will cure fatty infiltration of the liver. Or you can take cancer chemotherapy drugs, which cures lots of stuff, except for the cancer, except for the short life. But it uh, lowers cholesterol. If you go on chemotherapy because you stop eating, your blood pressure comes down, your blood sugar comes down, your cholesterol comes down. What doctor would brag about a weight loss program based around cancer chemotherapy? Ladies, gentlemen, come on and see me. I, I was treating breast cancer and colon cancer in the past. Now I got all these drugs. So I figured out these chemotherapy things don't work. So I got all these extra drugs. Why don't you come and see me? I'm going to change my practice from, from an oncologist. I'll be a, uh, a weightologist, an obesityologist. I don't know what they call them. Brand new weight loss program. You don't have to waste all those chemotherapy drugs that you're ready to throw in the trash. You can use them. Okay, or you could do this. 
you could recognize the hunger drive as being correct. You can recognize the stomach as being the right size. You can recognize your intestinal tract as being the proper length. If you eat a starch-based diet, you're never hungry. You can eat as much as you want. You can eat as often as you want. I don't care. And don't tell me you're going to gain weight on rice or potatoes. You know, this is a figment of your imagination. I've been doing this for 47 years, and I've been challenged by a whole bunch of people who think they have the worst eating disorder in the world. And if I sat them down in front of a bushel basket full of potatoes, they'd gain weight. Well, I've challenged a few of them along the way, and you know what? They never gain weight. So don't tell me you can't solve the problem by eating the right food, because I know you can. And what do I offer as evidence? I offer evidence of populations of people throughout history who've lived around the world, who've lived on starch-based diets. Like, for example, the Chinese, published in JAMA in the year 2013, was the uh, incidence of type 2 diabetes in China. And what they said in there is before 1980, fewer than 1% of the population had type 2 diabetes and obesity was virtually unknown. Do you think those people had fatty liver disease? No. They ate as much as they wanted. They fought battles. They did a lot of events. They had babies. They worked their jobs. They did everything just eating. The food is empty. Your hunger drive is not wrong. Get over it. You do not overeat. Your stomach was not designed too big for your body. You're not, well, you may be psychi psychiatric and emotionally impaired. I'm not going to say you're not. But, but, but that's not the cause of your weight. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a lack of good thoughts, folks because I'm sure you spent hours and hours trying to bring up those good thoughts and not a pound was lost. Anyway, uh, there is rightness in nature. There is correctness there. You know, things ought to make sense. And the only thing that makes sense to me is that if you match the human being with its proper environment, in other words, food, you'll get the most out of the body. You'll get it looking, feeling, and function at its best. That's what I think. Anyway, don't let anybody get you all excited about fatty infiltration of the liver. Just ask them, do you drink alcohol? If they say no, then you say, well, then you got to fix your diet. You probably notice they're type 2 diabetic and they're overweight and so all kinds of things. Let this not be a problem problem for you in the future or any, any, any reason for confusion. This is simple stuff. Okay. You know what I like to do this morning, uh, AJ? Hey, Chevy. Sorry about that. I, I turn I turn my sound and picture off when you're on so that we can well, get a yeah, thank you very much because I like that little chipmunk. <laughs> what you would know, you like to do? You know what I think that I would do this morning. You know, I, I will answer people's questions if that's what you'd like to do. But absolutely. We well, one of them, uh, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is how did they even find that the Gila monster had this? Did somebody get bit and then they realized they lost yeah, weight? And then lots of people got bit who lived in the Southwest by the Gila monster. Right, but how did they figure out they were going to use it as a drug? Well, because it caused nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. I don't know. I, I don't know what what I don't know what the uh, the discussion in the office is how that figure, figured out. But you know, people know what poisons are. We know what the rattlesnake venom looks like. You know, we we know what these things do. We know what shigella poison acts like. It's a bacterial infection. That boy, oh boy, I I think with shigella poisoning, you could really lose some weight. Okay, folks, uh, let's see you, ladies and gentlemen. Don't you get this idea before me and go out and set up a company that sells Shigella poisoning. Don't you do that. Come on now. I need to make a little money too. I'm getting ready for retirement. <laughs> but this is affecting children now, isn't it, Dr. McDougall? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I actually got a letter this morning. Now, these letters make me feel so good, I tell you. Well, first of all, I got a letter from uh, Jeff Armstrong's son. Jeff Armstrong has been a patient of ours for probably, well, at least since 20, 20, 2002. He started at 100 pounds overweight, has enjoyed the rest of his life, a trim, healthy, hearty, fully functional, and now he's in his you know mid-late 70s and still enjoying that kind of life. Well, his son wrote me a letter and talked about how he was like dad, had similar problems, and he hated it. Well, growing up, hearing about this McDougal character all the time. Well, you know, at least three times in his life, the McDougal character became very important. He lost like 100 pounds. And he finally, in the end of the letter, says, you know, I think I finally learned it. The third time's the charge, the charm. I, I finally learned it. 
anyway, that was cool. That was one letter I got. And then the next letter I got, it really was the next letter. It was from uh, one of the medical students who had been with me in 2018. And she, you know, she saw, she saw 12 days of people being cured. That's the thing about the medical students and residents who come and visit us. They never, they never leave unchanged. And, and many of them have totally, like this woman I'll tell you about, have totally changed their profession because they finally saw what being a doctor means as far as helping people get over their diseases. And she'd never seen it before. And neither have any other medical students or residents or doctors seen people get over chronic disease. I don't understand why they put up with this. They think they're helpless, I guess. Or maybe they didn't learn about diet therapy, I would guess. Anyway, this young woman who went into the field of pediatrics is now quitting pediatrics after five years. And she's going to dedicate her life to diet therapy for children. And she'll run a practice. And that's all she'll do. And I know and she'll make less money to start out. But that'll change quickly. She'll make a ton of money. Uh, you don't have to worry about uh, about income to, pra to practice in this way. Uh, it's out there. In fact, what you do is you just think about, oh, all I'm doing is taking a half a million from the heart surgeons. That's all. A year. <laughs> ah! Hey, listen, uh, uh, people, people like this young woman who is a, uh, I would assume, a board-certified pediatrician, the money doesn't matter anymore. You, you, you can't go to work every day and deal with disappointment. Patient after patient after patient. It's a bag full of drugs and a bunch of excuses. It's called managed care. They don't, they don't even apologize. My colleagues, don't even, they call it managed care. They like they talk to their their doctors, their residents, their medical students, and tell them we're going to teach you managed care. Well, what's managed care? It's switching from one brand of drug to another brand of drug. That's all you do. No thought of cure, reversal, remission, or whatever you want to call it. I call it cure. Anyway, what I thought we'd do, uh, you, you kind of uh, offered me another direction to go in, which is fine. I, I was thinking we could spend part of the hour, at least if if you folks would like to do this, uh, talking about why why the McDougal diet has disappointed you and what you found most difficult to do and what your friends and relatives tell you about why they won't make the changes that you've made, which result in such dramatic improvement in your health. I mean, what kind of issues are you running into? You know, uh, friends and relatives and people you love or problems you've had. I mean, you had to eat, you had to eat all, all day long on the McDougal diet or you lost weight. That I didn't like. Well, you really did, I know. Or, or I have these huge bowel movements three times a day and that takes up a lot of time. So I don't like the McDougal diet. I mean, give me sleep. I don't, I don't smell like dead animals anymore. So my friends don't relate to me. I smell like fruits and vegetables. They they can't they can't relate. They get near me and they start smelling me. They think I'm a foreigner because I smell like fruits and vegetables. They smell like dead pigs and cows and fishes. They do. So one of the interesting things I read a few books about Alaska and the Inuit Eskimo, and uh, what was uh, noted by the explorers in the 1800s is just how these people stunk of fish. And that's the way they described it. I'm sure the the uh, Inuits felt that body odor was pleasant. I mean, that's the way people adapt is they get used to the surroundings and then they, they incorporate them. So I'm sure it wasn't anything they noticed, but people coming from the outside world into a population that just lived on fish, these people had, had a very strong and offensive odor of fish. And you'll read that in various books about the Inuit Eskimo. You smell like what you eat. Why would you think otherwise? Anyway, I thought maybe we could do that, uh, AJ, if anybody had some real zingers for me. You know, this is why I don't or can't or won't or whatever follow the McDougal diet. And this is what my friends and relatives told me. If it doesn't go anyplace, we'll just do questions and answers. Whatever okay. you like. All right. So they weren't, they did not pre-submit on that because they didn't know. So I'm going to look in the chat. If anybody can please respond to what Dr. McDougal is asking right now, why can't you, or why haven't you been able to follow the McDougal diet? So, so far there's been no takers. I mean, I know what I hear from, you know, 
people in my circle, not necessarily the ones that are watching. It's just that, you know, it's the same thing. They don't try it, but there's this idea that the carbs make you fat. That's what, that's what I hear mostly potatoes. When I eat potatoes or rice, my blood sugar goes up, things like that. Well, there are answers, you know, the, the answer about, uh, you know, about your blood sugar going up. Of course it does. You go from foods that contain no carbohydrate, no sugar at all, like meat, pork chops, fish. Uh, cheese has 2% of the calories as carbohydrate. You go from no carbohydrates, carbohydrates, sugar that raises the blood sugar. Pretty smart, huh? Sugar raises blood sugar. So if you eat foods that contain no sugar, you have a, a low blood sugar. And then you introduce carbohydrate sugar into the diet, what happens? Your blood sugar goes up, it's supposed to go up. And you get scared. Well, you shouldn't get scared. You're not, you're, you're not focusing on the immediate benefits of the diet. I mean, if you, you want to have a low blood sugar, I can give you a low blood sugar. I'll just feed you nothing but no carbohydrate foods, you know, fish and chicken and beef. And maybe I'll give you a, a few extra pills or maybe a few extra shots. I, I can make your blood sugar anything I want. I'm a doctor. I got a prescription pad. If what you want to do is chase around immediate numbers, then fine. The McDougal diet is horrible because the sugar goes up. Like how much does it go up? Eh, maybe maybe it was 100. It went up to 140 or 160. Not a big deal. I never treat those levels. So that's doesn't need any treatment at all. Anyway. Um, okay. So they're saying things like, okay, the reason it's so hard is family members um, aren't supporting or are sabotaging uh, the, the pleasure trap. The, uh, they get sleepy after eating rice and potatoes. They are having cravings for sweets. Uh, my family doesn't want to do it. They can't live without their blank, 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 ice cream, animal products. Uh, these are the reasons the people in the chat are saying that they can't do it. It's too hard. The temptation is everywhere. It's overwhelming. Well, you, you know that I'm well aware of these issues, and but I've had, I've had 47 years to deal with them. So maybe I have some thoughts for you. On, on how to deal with them. Uh, the first book that Mary and I wrote was a uh, a two wing, a two ring notebook called "Making the Change." It wasn't called "Heal Obesity" or "Lose Weight" or you know "Reverse Heart Disease." It was called "Making the Change" because I knew that that would be the problem: is to get people to make the change. Uh, I, I think first of all, there are a couple of approaches that you might consider. One is the kind of person you are. If you're like Doug Lyle and Mary, my wife, Mary, then you take the attitude, it works for me. I mean, look at me, I look great. And that's one way you just kind of sit back and let people appreciate the meals you're making and the, and the wonderful health and appearance you have. That's fine. But then there are people like me and probably AJ and a lot of you who just are so excited about this message you can't keep quiet. I understand. It's probably better that you do until they're ready. And uh, these people, when you start presenting to them, they get threatened. Uh, I, I think some of the things you, you, that you could do to help this, there's a lot of educational material out there. Uh, not to mention the stuff that Mary and I and Heather have done. So you could just start maybe on a top topic that seems concerning or familiar to them. Say uh, diabetes is their biggest topic. They're tired of giving themselves shots and pills all day and they're starting to go blind, et cetera. Maybe that's the topic you got to start them with. Not the whole cancer and heart disease and all that stuff, but try and figure out what is most important to them. And just, you know, start out with, you know, you might find this person interesting. I did. Keep the enthusiasm down so that they can listen. And uh, then, you know, you might, in your interactions with them, point out some things that you've seen. Like, for example, there are no overweight Asians. And uh, you know that uh, potatoes are less than one calorie per gram, and oil is nine calories per gram. I mean, it's the little things you've learned along the way that they make be considered little nuggets of information that they want to have. People have a curiosity, naturally. So you kind of get them with a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And I have to say, until they're ready, you're very unlikely to make them uh, move in the right direction. But if you keep at them a little bit here and there, 
you know, in as non-threatening way as possible, and then make them a few dinners. Whoa! What we had last, what did we have last night, Mary? We had a, a stew. Moroccan lentil. Moroccan lentil stew. All right. I'll tell you, you make them the Moroccan lentil stew and some bread. And a little salt now. Remember, you got to put a little salt on the food to make it taste good. You sit them down with that, and they'll get up just like my grandson did last night. I want another bowl. I mean, this is a college kid, 19 years old, who has access to anything he wants. And he wanted another bowl of this uh, soup that Mary made, and I'll have it for lunch today. So there are some things that are familiar enough with your friends and relatives that they're worthy of an introduction of. In our family, because we were raised in California in the Midwest, things like soups and, and potatoes, and those are really familiar. But I remember my move to Hawaii in 1972. I was introduced to a culture that lived on rice. I didn't like rice, or at least I thought I didn't like rice. And then with a repeated exposure, rice has become one of my favorite starches. Anyway, start as much as you can from where they're at. Uh, unfortunately, there are two kinds of information that cause people to change. One are negative things to happen to them, like a heart attack or a breast lump or elevated blood sugar. I mean, these are things that make you stop and wonder whether it's time to make a change. And, and then those are negative things. I, it's, it's, it's tough to learn that way because you leave a trail of damage behind you. Dead heart muscle, amputated breasts, you know, a whole box of syringes. So a better way would be to learn in uh, from positive messages. Like get them to watch Chef, Chef AJ's show as often as possible. And get them to watch not just myself, but she has a lot of great guests on there. Just open the mind a little bit. And I, you know, I, I think a, a few challenges and some attention to what would make this person most likely to get involved. In others. What are they interested in? Diabetes, heart trouble, obesity, et cetera. It's probably obesity. And what kind of foods would, uh, would be things that they like right away? This delayed gratification, you can't do that. You've got to get them immediate gratification. Uh, I think an, another way is, uh, and this may be something you wouldn't do, but it would be go, go behind your mother or your sister's back and call the doctor and say, look, <laughs> you know, hopefully a, a sympathetic doctor who understands at least the value of the Mediterranean diet. Call, call the doctor, the doctor, write the doctor an email, get a, a little private time and say, look, my sister is killing herself. And she loves you, Doc. She just thinks the world of you. And if the words came from your mouth that she needs to change, she would listen. People listen to their own doctors. So I, I think that would be helpful. Um, and then if you have any groups uh, that, are self, that are supporting, it would be really good. And we paid a lot of attention to this on our 12-day program. Every morning during the 12 days, our participants get together by themselves, no staff. And they talk in the morning about seven o'clock in the morning, uh, all over the world, seven o'clock our time. It's like, you know, 7 p.m. in London. <clears throat> but but they, they get together and they talk and they support each other and they uh, bring out different issues and problems they're having, talk about successes, talk about us. You know, and we do that for 12 days. It's one of the most important parts of the program is to get this interaction, to get this community. And that's what people complain a lot is, there's no community of support. You got turn one corner and it's McDonald's, another corner Kentucky Fried Chicken. I mean, you couldn't even eat well if you wanted to. You know that's not true, but it takes some effort. Uh, so, you know, I, I I think working at them, being patient is, is going to work out for a lot of people. Try and get them more positive education. What I was trying to say is that even after the twelve day program, people meet all the participants, I mean, you know, hundreds of people that have been through our program, they meet every Wednesday morning at seven o'clock without staff. And we've been doing that for three years. I mean, can you think about a health, a health program, not a weight loss program? You know, weight loss happens to be one of the side effects that always happens if you need it. And, and instead of, uh, 
instead of the, this this be uh, being a burden, uh, you end up with a whole community that supports you and share recipes, share stories, etc. So we know that uh, that uh, supportive community and and uh, mutual respect and communication is really really helpful, and that's why we put so much emphasis on it in the program. Uh, let's see, anything else you could do? I know what you could do. You could send them to Dr. Goldhammer's place. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. I, tell, tell us, tell us, AJ. I mean, do you would 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 bread and water taste good after a week on this program? Yeah, just plain zucchini tasted better after the fast. Broth tasted amazing after the fast. Yeah, the way yeah. my dad used to say it is this is after a year in prison, water would taste like wine and bread would taste like a thick steak. I, I grew up with that saying. But, you know, you know, you don't eat or you don't even have to do it at Goldhammer's place. You know, the lecture I gave you on, on uh, hunger offers you a challenge to go without food for a weekend. So if you get somebody who's really serious about this and, oh, I just can't do it. I try so hard and I just can't do it. Don't eat Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Monday, you'll love the food. You know, Running education is an amazing education for them. Salt. Give them salt and sugar on the surface of the food so they get minimum amount of absolute substance and maximum amount of flavor. People love salt and sugar. Ah, that's why it's on the tip of the tongue. There's also a taste bud for starch on the tip of the tongue that's just as powerful as the sweet tasting taste bud. We are designed as seekers of salt, sugar, and starch. You know, you want to fight your basic nature, you're going to lose. You're going to lose until you find low-carb diets, and then you're going to make yourself sick immediately and long-term. You're going to lose until you can afford $1,000 a month for Ozempic. And then after, after you find that money, that $17,000, you have to face a plateau and weight gain and being sick all the time, feeling like a Gila monster bit you all day long. Or you can be hungry or even go through bariatric bypass, banding, sleeve surgery. It doesn't change your appetite at all. You must realize this. People who have this surgery, they just can't eat. They're ravenously hungry. And that's why, why people who get these, uh, even the more severe bariatric, bariatric surgeries, they fail. They can't because they can't deal with the hunger. Al Roker, I, I gave it as an example, and you know the, the ABC uh, newscaster, I think it's ABC, NBC, something. Al Roker, you know he's gone through a, a story of his obesity for I don't know, a few years. He lost 100 pounds, went from 350 to 250 after he had uh, intestinal bypass surgery. 100 pounds. Well, the next time you saw him, he was up 40 or 60 pounds. And uh, so what he did is he went on a low carb diet. And now when you look at him, he looks like he's gained uh, 40 or 50 pounds. So what's he going to do next? I know what he's going to do next. He's going to do Ozempic. And then we get started being sick, finds out he can get around the Ozempic poisoning. Then I think finally he may figure out that the way to do it is to eat starches, vegetables, and fruits. Satisfies your hunger drive, every, every other need you have. It keeps you healthy. So I think uh, education is really important. And and that's one of the reasons that AJ and I do this show and the other the other speakers is because we know the importance of knowledge and we know you're interested. As long as you're interested, we're going to be here. We're going to change the world. Dr. McDougall, people are asking, is, is fatty liver, at least non-alcoholic fatty liver diseases, is it always reversible or it ever gets to a point where it's just too late? No, it's not always reversible. It gets to the point where you have definite cirrhosis, which just means you have a dominant amount of scar tissue. So scars are not functional liver cells. So they don't do the job that liver cells are supposed to do. So they're just dead. It's like when you cut your forehead, you get a scar that forms here. It's not active in any way. It's just a scar. So you get a whole bunch, thousands of these scars in your liver, probably tens of thousands of little scars. And that replaces normal uh, functioning liver cells, which are gone. So you're, you have liver failure. You can't process all the toxins of the body and all the protein that you eat. Maybe you should go on a low protein diet. I think so. 
uh, anyway, um, I've, I've heard though, that not everyone with non-alcoholic fatty liver is actually overweight and that it's like a silent disease that people walk around. They don't know they have it. Oh, it's rare. Yeah. Uh, you know, well, I gave you some figures there. I think I told you that, um, half of the people with fatty liver have diabetes or the other way around half people with diabetes have fatty liver. And that uh, I give you some other figures. Uh, you know, that, anyway, that it's very common. It's it's not. No, they're not thin. Okay, I have to say it's classic. Just like with type two diabetes, if it's really type two diabetes, you're going to be obese or overweight. Now, if you don't have type two diabetes, like type one or type one and a half, then you might end up too thin because you don't have enough insulin. So if somebody's thin and they've got fatty infiltration of the liver and they still have elevation of blood sugar, you know, what, what I'm going to have to tell them is they don't have type two diabetes. Type two diabetics make as much insulin and often twice as much insulin as somebody without diabetes. It's just because of insulin resistance at the cellular level, the insulin doesn't work. A type one and a half diabetic, you know, type one's over here, type two's over here. A type one and a half diabetic has a relative insufficiency of function of the pancreas. In other words, they make too little insulin. And they have an element of insulin resistance. In other words, the, the insulin that they do have available, either by shots or by pancreas, is resistant. It, it doesn't function. So the sugar is beating up. But if you're going to still continue to eat the fat, You'd be trimmed with a fatty infiltration of the liver, although it's quite, in my experience, it's quite rare. Uh, people who have fatty infiltration of the liver, my, my past patient practice, which must involve at least, you know, at least 100 people. Well, every one of them was overweight. You know, they weren't like 100 pounds overweight, they're like 20, 30, 40 pounds overweight. It doesn't take much when you keep, when you stuff that fat in your, in your gut, with your fork and spoon, it doesn't take long before you end up stuffing. If you're fat, then your liver's fat, <laughs> and your omentum's fat, and your double chin is fat. Hey, look, look at people you see on the TV. Of course, you don't know any, right? You don't know any obese people. But you see the people on TV, what part of their body isn't fat? Their ankles are fat. Their thighs are fat. Their buttocks is fat. No, if you stuff if you stuff fat into the liver, you will get fatty infiltration of the liver, inflammatory liver disease, and you may end up trimmed because you're not producing enough insulin in the pancreas. You have type one and a half diabetes. You don't have type two. You see what I mean? You're not producing enough insulin. So as a result, you're not getting enough fat into the fat cells because insulin pushes fat into fat cells. Insulin pushes sugar into regular somatic cells, you know, the rest of the body cells. So that's what insulin does. It opens up the gate that's in the cell wall to let fat or sugar, energy inside. That's what it does. And uh, if your pancreas is not making enough insulin, then you end up losing weight. But that still doesn't negate the fat that you eat. You're still shoveling the fat in your body and your fat in the liver. It's just that you can't stuff it as well in the liver cells or the body fat cells when you don't have enough insulin. More insulin makes it you know, more efficient as far as stuffing the stuff in the fat. Anyway, uh, I guess I would summarize by saying that in my experience, it's been quite rare not to see somebody overweight and have fatty infiltration of the liver. And if it is, there's some other metabolic complication going on. They don't have type 2 diabetes. Layla's wondering how quickly can it resolve if it will resolve? Uh, days. Days, wow. Uh, yeah. It depends on how bad it is, uh, AJ, you know, it's just, well, look at it this way. What if you have 30 pounds of body fat in your abdomen, your buttocks, the thigh? And you use that as an obvious, you can't see it, gauge as to how your liver is doing. Then what you could do is you can figure, well, let's see, it's going to take me three months to lose 30 pounds. By that time, I bet the fat's gone out of the liver. But it starts to improve in days. As soon as you stop stuffing the fat in 
then more fat comes out than goes in. And then you're on the road to a cure when more fat comes out than goes in. But it might take, you might have like three months of fat in your liver. You can imagine having a, a gallon of fat stuck in your liver. Hey, that's a that's something to imagine, isn't it? A whole gallon of of, of, of chicken fat, you know, maybe a, maybe just a quart, a quart of chicken fat stuck in your liver. Did you eat liver growing up, Dr. McDougall? We we did, even though we were kosher, we ate only a certain kind. And it, it's just now when, when you think about what a liver does, it's kind of gross to think that we're eating organ meats, isn't it? You know, uh, AJ, from my childhood, if I had never become a doctor, much less a diet therapy doctor, I would have considered liver the most vile thing that I've ever smelled or tasted. My mother used to serve us liver once a year because she felt she had to, to get those special nutrients that are only in the liver. And she wanted to make sure her fit. So she sat us down with liver and onions. And my dog, Bonnie, was sitting right here to my side. Bonnie liked liver. I don't think I got more than a one or two bites down before I threw up. It's disgusting. Disgusting. I mean, you cover it up with eggplant and onions and spices. Why don't you just try plain old liver? Boil, boiled liver. I'll have boiled liver for lunch. Just think of all the poisons that are in the liver. The job of the liver is to detoxify environmental poisons that you take in. The, the liver is loaded with toxins. Got some vitamins too. <laughs> yeah. That was a real, I mean, I'm Jewish. Chopped liver was like a thing, you know, every Friday night. And it, uh, it just- Did you say oh. something derogatory about chopped? What am I, chopped liver? Yeah. Isn't, isn't that the saying goes? It wasn't a positive thing, AJ. That's funny. The, you know, there's- what, what, Oh, sorry. I mean, was it what you said? You know, what, what am I, chopped liver? Like yeah. you know, some kind of disgusting, yeah. close That's to funny. people matter. It's funny. I, I mean, I actually it liked it and I was not somebody that liked meat, but I don't know what my grandmother just made it delicious, but it's been like 50 years. Jamie says, Dr. McDougall, do you know what causes liver lesions and how to get rid of them? Mine are non-cancerous, but I have nine of them. Yeah. You know, there are all kinds of cysts and scars that occur all over the body, much less the liver. The, the way that, first of all, most of these uh, non-troublesome liver mass can be identified as cysts or scars and not be suspected of being cancer. So just by, by the ki kind of uh, imaging that we have with CAT scans and sonograms and so on, even without doing a liver biopsy. So, uh, you know, I, I, but it does turn into cirrhosis and they say it even turns into liver cancer if you keep eating that unhealthy way. So Jamie wants to know, um, I'm pre-diabetic. Do I just dive into the carbs or do I taper into them slowly? Well, it depends on whether you want to get well or not. If you slowly get into it, your chances of succeeding are small because you constantly have the old food tempting you, the old social issues, your friends and relatives you used to have dinner with or uh, party with, et cetera. Unless you break those habits, it's too hard. It takes about three or four days to, to stop the pain from withdrawal, say emotional or psychological. It, it happens pretty quickly. And, um, you know, it doesn't, doesn't take long to change. So. Nice. Do you want to answer any more questions that were submitted, if yeah. they, even if they're not well, exactly if, on this if, topic? If this, if this is all that you have to tell me as to why the McDougal diet is too hard to do, then we can move on to questions. Okay. Thank you, Dr. McDougal. Some of them are on different topics because we didn't you know. You know, I'd like to add a couple more things. Sure. I can remember when I started out, I, I never got satisfied. You know, I still was hungry because I wasn't used to the new foods and the way they satisfy hunger. And I call this the Chinese restaurant syndrome. When you go to a Chinese restaurant, you get done with your friends, you get up and you're hungry 15 minutes later because you're eating rice and vegetables rather than a, a, a big glob of meat and, and a, a bunch of fat. So the body's used to having this, this clump of meat 
and this gob of fat in it, and that's what it thinks satiety is. Well, once you stop eating this way, then the first three or four days, you may have Chinese restaurant syndrome, and you may find the meals just unsatisfying. I'm still hungry. Well, what do you do? Eat. Yeah, but I just had breakfast. Well, eat again. Well, I just had lunch and, and a snack. Well, eat again. Well, I just had a snack and lunch and dinner and, and dessert afterwards. Well, eat again if you're still hungry. Not the dessert. <laughs> eat the potatoes. So, so I, I think, you know, you've got to prepare yourself for a little bit of adjustment. And you have to realize that the body adjusts to just amazing things. You know, it adjusts quickly to new temperatures in the room. It adjusts quickly to smells. It, it, it has the ability to adapt. And it has the ability to adapt, adapt its taste buds. Just give it a chance. Put your favorite spices on it. You know, people tell me they, they could eat cardboard if they had Tabasco sauce. Oh. Yeah, the sauce makes it for sure. I, I, just, I, just, I just thought I'd throw out something different, AJ, to see if... Uh, see if people want to play a little bit and have some fun, but yeah, well, I mean, you know, I mean, there, one of the things I'm seeing in the chat and you, you, I know that you're not a big believer in this term, even though you kind of talked about it in your introduction to the pleasure trap, when you asked, why is this so hard for people? The term food addiction keeps coming up. I have, I have a problem with that. You know that. Yes, I do. The reason I have a problem with it is I'm a doctor. Okay. I've been, through withdrawal with many patients uh, from opioids, alcohol, tobacco, many other drugs, benzodiazepams. I know what true withdrawal is. You have seizures, you're, you're basically out of control, shake, end up in or ambulance picking you up, taking you to the hospital for seizures. That's That's addiction. And you're not going to tell me that your habituation to food anywhere matches that level of withdrawal. Never seen it. Never seen anybody give up tri-tips and have a seizure ever. Nah, it's you. You, you know, you just uh, addictive is a, a more acceptable word than many of you feel makes it more justifiable to not be in control of your life. That's why you use the word addiction. Rather than habit, you think, well, habit's a little thing. I should be able to fix that. But no, no, I got an addiction. Well, you can call it anything you want. I know it's hard to change. Now, I know it's difficult, but it's not an addiction. Not in the terms that I look at it. It's just a heck of a habituation that you're having a hard time getting over. When I smoked cigarettes, I was addicted. But I was also habituated. Because my whole life surrounded cigarettes. Got up in the morning, lit a cigarette. You know, cup of coffee, another cigarette. Go out with friends with a drink, another cigarette. Your whole your life, your life is surrounded by this kind, this, this substance, alcohol or tobacco or heroin. That, that's your whole life. But I suppose with some of you, food's your whole life. You could call it addiction if you want, but you understand why I don't look at it this way. Yeah, I get it. It's just, it just seems so hard for people to make the change. That's when I've seen, I, I had no well, idea. Well, just say it's hard. Yeah. Why do we have to call it addiction? You know, in, in that sense, it gives value to something that it doesn't have. You know, I, I, gave, up, I gave up my pork chops. When do I get my seizure? When does the ambulance arrive? When, when, do I, when do I stop shaking? Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. I've seen this. This has been my whole career of people who are addicted, who go through withdrawal. Never saw it. Giving up Kentucky Fried Chicken. Yeah. No seizures. Yeah. I think I think it's the sugar and the, the refined carbohydrates that tend to be very don't, difficult. Don't, you, don't get me on sugar. Okay. Yeah. Well, yesterday, you know, I can't win with you. I Yikes. <sighs> Sorry, what? Or just hit the window, and I hope he didn't pass away. Um, see, see, <laughs> see what you do. You get me so excited, you know, because you don't want to. I sent you something with sugar yesterday, but that wasn't good either. Well, you know, AJ, that wasn't, uh, that wasn't good because it had it had other stuff in it. 
we weren't set up for what you were going to send. And I, the joke is that I eat Babe Ruth bars on Thanksgiving. Yeah. No, and Halloween. You, Halloween. Oh, okay, thank you. Halloween. Yeah, I probably, I probably have some leftover for Thanksgiving too. Uh, so anyway, I kind of joke that once a year the grandkids go out and get me Babe Ruth bars. That's the project for all all seven of the grandkids. Is did you find a Babe Ruth bar, bar, bar for Grandpa? And then they bring it home and I eat it. But I only do that once a year. So you can be moderate then. Yeah, one out of three hundred sixty-five days. Actually, one hour, or, or, or fifteen minutes out of three hundred sixty-five days times hours times minutes. Not that much. Yeah. Well, you know, I met. You know, you, you bring up a point though, AJ. Is I would not have a cigarette. Okay, I, I mean I'm serious. When, when I when we used to fly on airplanes, and they had a smoker section, and you had to sit among uh, or behind the smokers, or even before they had a smoker section, you used to sit next to a smoker. I would I would uh, get off that airplane, go to my hotel room, and go to sleep, and I would have this recurrent dream, and that is that somebody made me smoke a cigarette. And the, the withdrawal that I experienced and knew was coming from that one cigarette they made me take, that I wake up in a cold sweat. That's addiction. Did you go through withdrawal when you were quitting cigarettes? And did you yeah. go through, I mean. Yeah, I, 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 I you know, for, mostly it was a desire for tobacco, but. Did you um, quit on your first try or did it take you several it took times? times. Yeah. 12 times. 12 times I quit smoking before I finished. Wow. Uh, last time I smoked was October 20th, 1972 at 7 a.m. in the morning. That's the last cigarette I had. <laughs> what kind did you smoke? Marlboro's. Figures. But, you know, I would I would smoke uh, butts out of ashtrays. I was a, well, excuse me, anybody out there that's a cigarette smoker or any type of tobacco user, when I say lighting butts out of ashtrays you go i used to do that too are <laughs> you sure you did that's addiction you know if, if i if i could take and, and dump your tri-tip in a in a in a, in a can of garbage and you'd eat it afterwards that'd be like taking a butt off of a cigarette ashtray and smoking it can i take your favorite tri-tip and throw it in a, in a basket of garbage and then you take it out and eat it well, then you're not an addict because somebody really adapted to that tri-tip would crawl through that basket of garbage and get it out of there because I would have done that for a cigarette. That's addiction. I know what addiction is. Personally and professionally, I know what addiction is. So call it what you want. But until you start digging through the garbage looking for your piece of tri-tip that you threw out, I don't believe you. Or at least you don't relate to what I relate to. It's a matter of terminology. It's not that I don't believe you. That's not the correct thing to say. It's a, it, We have a definite difference in terminology, which I feel serves you poorly. You know, if you, if you treat this like something that's not, you're less likely to win. Well, you know, I didn't go through any withdrawal. I realized that, but, you know, I miss it. You know, I've gotten the habit of having this stuff every day and ice cream after every dinner at night. I got, that was my habit. Well, what did, did you, were you addicted to the ice cream? Well, what do you mean? What, 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 how would I be addicted to ice cream? Well, when you stopped eating it, did you have a seizure? When, when you stopped eating it, did you, did you go through the garbage can and get, the, get a, a, a half empty ice cream carton out so that you could solve that addiction? Did you do that? Talk to an addict. Talk to an addict. If you don't know one, <laughs> I don't know. You probably do. But that's our lives, addicts. You know, it's been so long for me since I had anything hyper palatable. But I do remember when I got off sugar and caffeine, July 6, 2003, I had, you know, it was about four or five days of really bad headaches and nausea and diarrhea. And I'm, I'm crying and I did not feel well for that first week. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you could prove me wrong. But it was but so long it, has, it, hasn't, it hasn't been my experience. Uh, well, you know, that. I, I, you had a speaker once at one of your advanced study weekends that I've since, you know, become friendly with and have interviewed, and I really like her. Her name is Dr. Pamela Peak, 
And at your conference, she was showing slides of brain scans of people like, because she wrote a book called The Hunger Fix, you know, people having sugar and people having, uh, you know, cocaine and heroin and, and similarities in the brain. Mm -hmm. So you don't okay. believe that. Anyway, well, I I don't, I'm not here to argue with you. I'm just well, telling you what the, what the people are I saying. I explain to you why the definition of addiction in my mind is different than it is for yours. And it, it is severe withdrawal. Uh, the fact that you had headaches and diarrhea and so on when you gave up sugar. Do the study. Do the study. I, I don't think I would find at the end of an experiment. Well, let's just say that for a lot of people, there's a lot of discomfort associated. Uh, whatever you want to call it. I don't care. Okay. I don't, I'm not here to argue with you. I'm just having some fun uh, because... I, I think it's important, AJ. I think for people to uh, to... You know, ascribe a uh, a value to something that's not true. How are you going to win? You know, it's, it's, it'd be the same as saying smoking cigarettes is a habit. That they used to tell us that all the time. Do you remember? It's a smoking is a bad habit. Yeah, doctors what, used to recommend. What, what, do you remember the doctors used to recommend cigarettes to their patients a long time ago, like to calm down? Well, what what chance would a, 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 a tobacco addict have if he or she thought this was just a simple bad habit? Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Is that for the addicts, the, the calling it a habit uh, weakens it, 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 it to the point where you're, you're not going to be able to establish enough effort, enough uh, pushback to get over the addiction. If you treat this like like I did with cigarettes, October 20th, 1972 at 7 a.m. in the morning, if you treat this as is something that you're going to eventually get over, you know, if you suffer enough for, for a period of time, then you can deal with it. But you have to face the fact that you're going to go through this suffering. If, for example, you're told you have food that's an addiction and you stop eating pepperoni pizza and you don't have a seizure, do you still call it an addiction? I, I, I just, I think the terminology is important and I hear it come out a lot and, and you folks uh, may not like what I have to say. I've taken care, taken away a, a, a position that I may have given you comfort, but I've told you why I don't consider this an addiction. Then what is the, why for so many people do they have an inability to stop? Like, really? I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's a lot of things. Uh, we were we were raised. Our generation was raised after the Great Depression, and my mother, uh, she lived on uh, sweet potatoes and turnips. The only reason they had a house is the landlord gave them free rent for two years, and that's how my mother and her family lived. Turnips and potatoes. She promised. That's in the 1930s. She promised that my children would never have to suffer like I did. As soon as she made sure we had plenty of calcium and protein rich foods. So, you know, that's that's an ex example of, of going in, in the ex exact opposite direction. Oh, and, and you know, the way I set up an experiment, uh, AJ, you know, to decide whether this is addiction or not, is I, I would set up other criteria for addiction. Is it seizures or is it diarrhea? Or is it, uh, you know, I don't know. you got to set up certain criteria. And then you take one group and you have them stop eating the meat or dairy. And another group, you don't. You see what happens with the two. I know it will happen with tobacco. I know it will happen with an alcoholic. I know it will happen with a benzo addict. I know it will happen with an opioid addict. I know because I've seen it dozens of times. But I've never seen it happen with food. Hey, would you like to uh, debate one of the people that disagree with you on this? That could be very uh, exciting. Well, I, I will basically say the same thing I just said. Yeah. Anyway. Ah, would you like to answer questions that aren't related to food addiction and non-alcoholic? I, I would be happy to, since you got hey, me into a very... You seem, you seem obvious, like you're... Obviously, AJ, you have the audience on your side. 
Well, I'm not, I oh, listen, I, I just want to help people. I don't need to be right. It's just that Dr. McDougall, the people I haven't, maybe haven't had the same success with you working with people like you do in a 12 day program. But what I hear from them is just that, and it's not, I don't like the word food addiction because you can't be addicted to food and eating. It's particular foods. It's the refined carbohydrates, like the sugar, flour, and alcohol, those kind of foods usually in conjunction with high fat. It's not it's not potatoes, broccoli, arugula, any of those foods, you know? It's it's basically processed junk food. Next question. Okay. So this is a changing subjects. This is from Karen. Um is it true Dr. McDougall that if we have osteoporosis we should avoid peas, beans and lentils and if so why? Well, because uh uh, uh Dr. Jenkins, uh, David Jenkins from the University of Toronto, did a study where he fed uh, isolated plant proteins to people and they lost calcium and bone material. And then there's other studies on soy, isolated soy protein that show similar. Um, It's something that I started many years ago because as I mentioned to you before, is my patient population was often made up of people who had 10% of their kidney function, 10% of their liver function, 10% of their heart function left. So how much extra protein are you gonna give these people? Okay, then the question comes up, well, how about somebody who's only lost 30% of their kidney function? Do you know that by age 70, that uh, that just through normal attrition by eating the Western diet, you've lost more than 20% of your kidney function just from eating the Western diet. So with those people with 20% loss function, are you gonna feed them unrestricted protein? I, 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 uh, and how about somebody who has osteoporosis like this caller said, she's got definite osteoporosis. Okay, so she's lost you know, half her bone mass, how, how much extra protein are you going to feed her? Well, you understand that the, the body needs 3% of its calories as protein and beans, peas, and lentils are 30%. You have to deal with that extra 27% protein. How, how, how big of a burden is it on somebody with normal liver, with normal kidneys? Probably not much. And, and that's why I don't restrict it in those people, normal people. But how about somebody who has loss of kidney function or liver function or bone mass? I think it's best to give them as conservative diet as possible. Thank you. Okay. There was one here about, well, I don't know if you can answer this one. It's about a trigger finger. What causes it and what to do about it? Will the potato help that? Happens, what happens in a trigger finger is you have a tendon sheath uh, that surrounds the tendon, okay? And and then the ten, tendon is like, like a rod that goes in the sheath. The tendon gets inflamed and it forms a nodule on it. And this nodule gets hooked up in the sheath. In other words, you have this round uh, tendon sheath through which the tendon passes. The tendon gets inflamed and it gets stuck in the sheath. And so that you can maybe bring your finger out this far and then this little thing is stuck in the tendon sheath. Now you can just go like this. It'll solve it temporarily. But how do you solve it permanently? Surgery. Yeah. Probably, probably surgery is the only thing that I know that would be effective. If you really have the problem, uh, is to go in and, and cut the sheath and somehow or another reduce the size of the tendon. We also used to give steroid injections, but again, you're decreasing the swelling of the uh, of the of the tumor mass or the the swelling because you cut down the inflammation by giving steroids. So that has been temporarily effective, but it's not long-term effective. So, so how, why do you get it? Uh, I don't know, maybe, 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 I'm sure it has to do with food, but maybe uh, you know it has to do with manual work that you did, like maybe you were a typist, or worked on some type of repetitive motion that over-exercised this particular part of your anatomy. That's possible. Thanks. This is from Esther, but not our Esther. Uh, 
this question is I've been whole food plant-based two years, but my cholesterol is still super high. The LP little a and APOB um, are both very high. I'm concerned. Uh, I'm still overweight and I'm a compulsive eater, even on healthy food. Well, I, I really, the, the only thing I can say is you have to deal with the problem. It's the food. You fix the food, you no longer be overweight. You fix the food and, uh, you know, most of your other troubles will go away. But you have to fix the food. What were the problems that she had, uh, AJ? Um, high cholesterol, high LP, little a, and APOB. The lipoproteins are sure. Yeah, they'll get better. Cholesterol come down. You know, we showed that in our work, cholesterol comes down 22 points in seven days. You would find a, 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 an associated improvement in LPA uh, and other, other lipoproteins. They all go in the same direction when you eat a healthy diet. Why? Because they're all subfractions of the lipoprotein, cholesterol, triglycerides, and protein. They're called. They're, they run around in packages. Uh, they don't. The cholesterol doesn't appear in the blood alone, or fat alone, or protein alone. They they come in packages called lipoproteins, which are made of fat, protein, and cholesterol. And uh, if you eat a, 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 a unhealthy diet with full of cholesterol, then the total cholesterol goes up. And so it's the bad cholesterol, but the good cholesterol goes down. And so you get changes in your uh, particle size. So you get changes in your uh, LPA levels, all those change. So I, I have to encourage you to get the problem fixed and then you won't be disappointed. You don't eat it. Well, this brings back to some of the dietary advice people accept. And that is there's something special about turnips to lower LPA. Tell me I just need to eat turnips or, or, or uh, asparagus will take care of a, a low HDL cholesterol. No, duh. don't think that way. It, it's, these individual plant foods have little power at all. What they do is they return the body to its natural state of health and healing, which allows it to put everything back in line. But it doesn't have any magical properties that you know, asparagus lowers LPA or raises LPA. Or, and, and so I can't give you the kind of advice that you may have wanted is that you know because your LPA is up, you need to eat more turps. No, because your LPA is up and you're overweight and your total cholesterol is high and you probably have high blood pressure and high triglycerides and maybe even you're pre-diabetic or not diabetic, the problem's the food. So let's not talk about individual foods as being little miracle pills. They're not. you got to fix the underlying problem, which is you have to eat a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. Yep. A a Amy, who's watching live, says her gastroenterologist recommends your book. And I do love your book, Digestive Tune-Up. And the next question is on a GI topic and it's from Max. And he says, you recommend that it's okay to get a sigmoidoscopy, but it's really hard to find a doctor that will do it. I finally found one, but he doesn't have the equipment in the office. They can only do it in the hospital. Are there risks to a sigmoidoscopy and how do you prep for one? Uh, virtually none. It's just a two foot tube, which is now flexible. You know, it, it, it bends. So as you move up uh, the rectum and into the colon, you know, the descending colon, it, it can make those bends. When I first started doing sigmoid exams, and I did them in my office for at least a decade, we had a silver tube, stiff, didn't bend this long. And I used to have to go in, you know, you'd pass the anus and I'd get into the rectum and then I'd have to pull down like this to get the curvature of the rectum to straighten out. Then I'd push the tube in further and then I made another bend and pushed it a little further. Well, you know, you could probably get into some problems with these uh, rigid scopes of perforating the bowel. But we don't use those anymore. So we use sigmoid, flexible sigmoid uh, scopes, which is, as far as I know, complications are extremely, extremely rare. Perforation is, uh, I don't so, know. So it doesn't really happen in, in a sigmoidoscopy the way it can happen in a colonoscopy is what I think you're saying. With a, colon, with a colonoscopy, what you do is you have, because you have to go through many more turns and serious turns to get this six or eight foot tube up. 
the perforation rate is like one in two, one in a thousand. So you end up killing, you kill one person from, from bleeding or infection or perforation, and you save another person from colon cancer. And so that's why the studies show the only, only randomized control trial ever published was published last year in the October 27th, 2022, New England Journal of Medicine. It was a 10 year study involving 84,000 people in Europe, Poland, Norway, other European countries. So by the way, they don't do colonoscopies. This is kind of a virgin population as far as colonoscopies go. And so they started a 10 year project, a randomized control trial. And at the end of two year, 10 years, there's no difference in survival. Every, every gastroenterologist ought to deal with that study before they talk to anybody about getting a colonoscopy. Wouldn't you like to know that it doesn't work? Wouldn't you like to know that there's never been a controlled trial that shows colonoscopy saves lives? Now, wouldn't you be, wouldn't you be advantaged to knowing that you have a significant 7% risk, excuse me, 7 tenths percent risk of major complications? In other words, about one in 100. Major, you know, like life-threatening complications from having this done. Don't you think you should know that before you sign on to this $3,000 invoice? I think so. I tell you, I must be losing my mind tonight. I get I get carried away on this subject uh, subject this morning. I forget how we started. That happens to be a lot, AJ. You know, I I um I people always think it doesn't happen to them until it did. And I had a very dear friend and a coworker. He was sixty years old. It was just it wasn't a screening colonoscopy. His doctor said, "Okay, Mike, you're sixty. You have to do it," and he died. Like, and so that really changed my opinion on them because I had had them when I was younger because I had precancerous polyps, but seeing this gentleman vibrant, you know, on, on a Thursday and dead on a Friday changed my opinion. And this was a good hospital too. You know, I'm not going to say the name, but it was an esteemed hospital. So yeah. Is, is the prep, is the prep as intense for a sigmoidoscopy? The same I don't thing? think so, uh, AJ, but it's been so long since I've done a sigmoid. It's been probably 30 years. So I, I don't know what the protocol is. My, my guess would be it'd just be an enema to clear off the last part of the, yeah. of the intestinal tract, that you don't have to go through a full bowel prep like you would have colonoscopy. But believe me, they will tell you. They will tell you that it's going to take two or three days to get your bowel cleaned out. And you're not going to be very happy those two or three days. In fact, a lot of people say that the, the prep is worse than the test. Yeah. You, I'm guessing you've never had one. I have. Actually, I had one when I was a medical student at Drosky Ferguson Drosky, which wow. is a FDI hospital in Grand Rapids, Michigan. AJ, you know, all through my career, I've taken the attitude that I'm not going to recommend things to my patients that I haven't experienced. So most of the drugs that I've prescribed, I've taken for at least long enough period of time to see the side effects and the benefits. I didn't continue them, but I tried the blood pressure pills and you know, cholesterol pills and, you know, just to see what you go, went through. Well, I also had this sigmoid done, sigmoidoscopic exam done at Drosky Ferguson Drosky in Grand Rapids, Michigan, when I was a senior medical student. Whoa, and I'll tell you, that was a painful experience. It really was. I'll never have that done again. <laughs> but these days, if they did it, they do it with a flexible scope and it'd be nothing. Yeah. 200 bucks cost you 200 bucks it's done in a doctor's office no sedation people die from sedation that they're, what they're saying or what max is saying is they won't do it in the doctor's office anymore they don't have it there anymore that, well it's only because they don't have the instrument but you know chef aj they could be, they could put down a couple thousand bucks or whatever they cost and buy one for their office it's not like anybody's uh unable to buy one you just go on amazon and buy one you know, <laughs> just we'll, we'll each get one and we'll bring it to our doctors That's you funny. have you have one you have one, uh, one at home for play how's that <gasps> oh my god <laughs> you know you mentioned having things done to you that you're doing to patients have you ever had an arterial blood gas taken yeah i used to be a respiratory therapist and i just i i was the same as you i go suction me give me a blood gas i didn't i didn't like any of those things i didn't want to do them to people because i didn't like having them done to me 
you have to realize, Chef AJ, at 18 years old, I was in the hospital for two weeks. I had a spinal tap. I had an angiogram where they stuck needles in my neck. These days they do it from your groin, but they stuck right under my chin. They, they tapped the two carotid arteries. I woke up that later that day after pushing this dye into my brain and seeing that I had a lacunar infarct, which gave me total, total left hand plesia. I, I woke up and my chin was touching my chest from the blood that was in my neck from this procedure. I had a spinal tap. You know, I, 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 I spent two weeks in the hospital there. You know, I've had a couple other brushes with the system too. So well, believe me, most of what's done to you, I've done. Mm. Okay, uh, this is from Letty. And she said, Dr. McDougall, I know you've said to eat 90% starch, but when I go that low on fruits and vegetables, I'm constipated. Is it okay to eat more fruits and vegetables? Sure. You know, Mary corrects me. Uh, you know, I say 90% starch. And the reason I do that is I want you to make sure the dominant food on your plate is starch. You know, I tell you, don't count it, don't weigh it, don't consult a dietitian. Just look at your plate. And 90% and of the food on your plate should be a starch. And Mary says, well, you don't even do that. Well, that's true, I don't, because your non-starchy green and yellow vegetables are so low in calories. If I do it by calories, then I do. But if I do it by what you see on the plate, maybe 70% is uh is starch and 30 percent is green yellow vegetables but i do it for an impact factor i do it because i really want you to get that starch in because if you don't now remember chinese before 1980 ate 90 percent of their diet is white rice i bet if i did a careful survey if there's a, such a thing available on uh, mayans and aztecs who ate corn i bet 90 percent of their calories probably their food came from corn you know, I'm darn sure that uh, the Irish uh, post-potato famine or pre-potato famine, the Irish were eating 10 pounds of potatoes a day. A active male Irishman ate 10 pounds of potatoes a day. It would have to be 90% of their food, particularly since asparagus and broccoli and cauliflower are seasonal. Whereas, whereas the grains and the legumes and even the root vegetables, you can store for months, if not years. So it's just for the lack of availability historically. I don't believe that people ate more than 10% of their diet as non-starchy foods. Counted by calories or the food on your plate. Either way, that's my conclusion, is that historically, historically, 99.99% of people who walk this earth followed starch-based diets. And they didn't have refrigerators. They didn't have transportation. You know, your, your perishable green and yellow vegetables, that's why they call them perishable. They spoil in a week, whereas your starches don't. I can't think of any starch that spoils quickly, can you? I mean, you put potatoes in a cool, dark place, last for months. So that's a real distinction of starch. And again, I wanna to emphasize to you, if we look at the world picture, you know, the million years that human beings have been on earth, I have to come to the conclusion that the bulk of their calorie intake was from starch. You can call bulk 70%, you can call bulk 90%, but I want you to eat the starch. And if you feel better eating a few more green and yellow vegetables, you know we recommend this uh, if you wanna lose weight faster. It's the, the maximum weight loss program. We recommend up to half your plate being, being green and yellow vegetables. So how's that for being liberal? Half your plate. So delicious. And here I am wearing uh, mostly vegetables today. Not very much starch on my shirt. You got corn there. Yeah, I got corn. Thank goodness, huh? Probably got a, uh, I got a avocado. So you probably want to, you want to cover that up, won't you? Oh, good. I haven't eaten. <laughs> That's you funny. don't eat avocados. I, I, the coconuts. I see coconuts on your shirt. You should oh. put some on that. It's over on the right shoulder. I haven't even looked. Sorry about this. I, I don't have an all potato shirt like you, but I'll have to get one. I, I, I had one. I wore it last night. 
Yeah, that was cute. My, my sister really liked it. All right. So here's a question about iron from Cindy. She says that her doctor tells her her iron is high at 49.9. It should be 46 and her body won't get rid of the excess iron and he won't remove it via phlebotomy. So she'd like to donate blood. What are your thoughts? That would be fine. Uh, that's what somebody with hemochromatosis does is they donate blood frequently so that they lower the amount of iron in their body. I care for patients with hemochromatosis. They go through liver failure. Uh, they, they, have, they have a shortened lifespan. And um, the way you get rid of the blood for somebody who has hemochromatosis is you send them off for blood transfusions. You have them donate blood. That's how you get, that's the basic treatment of hemochromatosis. Well, something else has been invented. That's, that's how you treat them. So yeah, it would be just fine. Uh, you got to think of the reasons that you'd have a mild elevation in your what, iron levels. Anyway, something's up. Probably iron. Fair. Something. He said something about her GFR that he wants to retest yeah. in a month and it's now 59. And so she's scared. And that he wants to put her on medicine for high blood pressure, 138 or 72. Yeah, well, you know how I feel about that. Yeah. You should not treat high blood pressure. According to the American Medical Association, Unless the blood pressure in somebody over the age of 60 is 150 over 90 or greater, or greater. That's the American Heart Association recommendation. The National Health Service in England, they say 160 over 100. And the Cochrane Collaboration says that they can't find benefits from using medication to treat a blood pressure of 150 to 160 over 90 to 100. You have to treat somebody who has lower blood pressure than that, you're not going to see any benefit and you're going to see harm. So uh, as far as the hemochromatosis, to get back to it, why would you run a higher hemoglobin or iron or hematocrit or whatever it was mentioned there? They all kind of go together. Well, why would that happen? Two reasons that are common. In addition to having this disease, which is, I'd have to review it to remember where it came from, but you get an elevated iron levels hemoglobin, hematocrit levels, when you smoke cigarettes. Why? Because of the carbon monoxide in the, in the tobacco smoke. So you breathe in this carbon monoxide and some oxygen, but it, it is uh, in proportion inadequate. In other words, there's, there's more CO2 and less oxygen than there ought to be. It's just smoke. And, and as a result to compensate for that difference, you know, caused by the carbon dioxide, you make more blood cells. So your hemoglobin, your matter could go up. Okay, here's another another reason it might go up. Uh, I think that uh, I get callers confused a little bit, but I think she said she was overweight. And being overweight indicates that you eat the Western diet. The Western diet causes the blood to sludge. I showed you the videos on that. You drop the oxygen content in the blood by 5 to 15% and as much as 20% just from the sludge in the blood. Well, what, how does the body compensate for that drop in oxygen tension? How, do, how, are you, how would the body compensate when you're running an oxygen tension of only, only 80% of what it ought to be? It makes more blood cells. So you've got, you got ele elevated... Uh, so I, I would look at the basics, you know, get yourself in good shape if you want the answer. And if you want to just temporarily lower your, your uh, iron levels, go get blood transfusions. Perfectly safe. They're reasonable to do. I don't know whether they'll take your blood or not. You know, sometimes, you know, the, the people are excluded based on certain findings. I'm not trying to say you will be, but uh, it's a, you know, that's a possibility. So... Yeah, she, she she didn't say whether or not she was overweight. But what do you think about low blood pressure? Because I got to I'm going to show you this picture. So last Tuesday, I went to my primary doctor, Doctor Nedley, who you know is a lifestyle doctor. And I not I wasn't sick, but you know I go once in a while for this or that. And I, I took a picture of my blood pressure, which was 86 over 56, and I posted it on Instagram. The post was liked by Doctor Dean Ornish, and people were ripping into me like, "Well, I I work in the emergency room, and you're hypotensive, and like you should be on medication." And it's like my blood pressure has always been this. Like I, I haven't fainted. Why are people getting their panties in a bunch? Are you hypertensive or hypotensive? 
I'm neither. I mean, why are people so upset that my blood pressure is 86 over 56? It's always been low. I've never passed out. So well, the, the, the bottom number is low, but the top number is low. Okay. Well, I, I think I, I think you uh, spend too much time looking for trouble. I wasn't looking. They always take your blood pressure when you go to the doctor. And he said it was a good blood pressure and everybody else is saying I'm hypotensive. Well, who are you going to listen to, Dr. Nedley or everybody else? Listen to Dr. Nedley. All right, well then close the case. It's yeah. not, Dr. Nedley knows what high blood pressure is. Yeah. He also knows what a good diet is. Yeah, he eats that diet too. I bet he's I, trim. Oh, he's <laughs> trim. I even brought him a pie. How do you like that? Okay. Uh, you are so good. What you need to do is give him some of those babe birth bars. <laughs> That's funny. So we actually have a question for Mary, if she's available from Gunther on cooking potatoes in the Instant Pot, if she's available You're to Mary? Yeah. Okay, we've got a question for you. You can sit there. You can stay where you are. Okay. okay. So, so she says, when Mary bakes potatoes in the oven wrapped in parchment sheets and aluminum foil, so they come out crisp and fluffy like Wendy's baked potatoes, can you use the same parchment sheet and aluminum foil method for the potatoes in the Instant Pot so that you don't have to use your oven? Hmm. I don't understand that question. I, I don't know. I have never well, what, what tried would you it. put parchment paper in an Instant Pot? You, you wrap potatoes just like you would put them in the oven yeah. and then put them in the Instant so Pot. So is it in steam or something? Is there, yeah, is, steam. Is there So you put water in with it? I don't know. I've never. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious why he wants to cook them uh, that way in an in an instant pot. But I would, uh, I would think if it's an instant pot, you have to put water in it to get. Yeah, steam. absolutely. Yeah, to steam it. I don't um, think they would turn out the same as in the oven. Yeah. No, the oven's the best. Thank you, Mary. You know, it also the instant pot is great for making mashed potatoes because you just put the whole potato. In we don't peel them. And then just not for health reasons. Them. It's for laziness. <laughs> Thanks, nice. Mary. So oh, a, yeah. live, a live viewer yeah. named Colleen says, we eat the McDougal way for over 20 years. Oh, no, we eat the McDougal way, but my 20-year-old eats fast food vegan and is overweight. She's been yeah. raised on your lectures. Do you have any tips? Be patient. It's amazing what happens to watch your children grow up. You know, you, you have these kids who are uh, these, these beings, these human beings. I have three of them and a, seven grandkids who you think are totally incapable uh, of pretty much no use at all in life. And then they grow up right in front of your eyes and they become fully functional, uh, reasonable people. When our kids were growing up and the grandkids too, Heather took care of them this way, is we didn't, we didn't focus on their eating when they left the house. We just fed them good food in the house and make sure good food was available and that they got the education. They went through periods. You know, Heather will tell you, if you ask her, that what she did in high school to rebel against Mary and I was not take drugs. She ate at McDonald's. That's a nice way to protest, isn't it? And I, I would just be patient. You know, these the kids, they grow up and they have children of their own and start looking at things differently. And I just step back, mom, and not get frustrated because you raised her right. You got taught her the things that were correct. You taught her to enjoy the right foods. She'll blossom, just like when kids go through an education about politics and religion. They rebel. Look what's happening in the world today. And then, you know, as they get older, you know, like Chef AJ and I, uh, you get kind of a more mature attitude about life. It's nice to see. I have to tell you, I've got three extremely functional children that contribute to society in great means. Heather, which you all know, my son, Craig, who's a professor at OHSU Medical School, and my other son, who's a chemist. And uh, they, they, you know, I'm very proud of my children. But it didn't happen by accident. You know, the amount of effort that Mary and I put into these three kids is reflected in how much effort the three of them are putting into their children. It wasn't by accident that they turn out to be nice kids. And they really are. Yep. Unbiased. You don't have to remind me I'm old, though. Thank you. <laughs> Kathy you're says, yeah. well, AJ, you're not a teen anymore. Well, not, you know, no. You know that we see people on TV now. The dominant age 
in the population that's active, you know, on, on TV, actors and politicians and so on. They're 50 and they talk about them being old. When you get to be my age, 76, good God, they want to retire you to the cemetery. Yeah, that's funny. But you know what? Okay. I, I, I don't feel old. Yeah. I feel just as young as when I was 30. And, you know, until I look at old pictures of mine and I realize what I used to look like, and then I look in the mirror, I don't appreciate the 40, 50 years that I've uh, gained in the last 40, 50 years. I feel good. Oh, so can you can you just think of something that you can give us for that for aging? And I'm I'm not I'm not happy with yeah. age. I, I think you ought to realize that it's going to happen. And again, it's kind of like the thing where you know you fight against things that aren't going to happen. You're going to get old. You're going to die. Okay, uh, face it. You may deny it as much as you can, but it's going to happen. And then what you want to do is you want to prepare for that as. Uh, as well as you can. You don't want to be sick up into your day of death. You don't want to be in pain. You don't want to spend your time in, in an operating room or in a doctor's office. You want to have a quality of life. So I would focus on between now and then, uh, just having a ball, just really enjoying yourself. We uh, looked so much better when we were younger. No, they really, I don't know. At least I, again, I've got, I've got a grandson here who's 19 years old. And I look at the problems that he has and the challenges he has in life. And I don't think I'd want to trade. Yeah. You know, I went through that. I don't think I want to go through it again. I think being 70 is pretty darn nice, especially since this is still working. I know like you're, you're questioning it after my dissertation on addiction and habituation. No, no, but, no. I just, I just, I'll, I'll let you know. I won't, bring, I won't bring it up again, AJ, but. No, no, I, 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 I love a friendly banter and I respect your opinion. And, and I, I feel like just people should do what, whatever they resonate with. But well, here's a question from Kathy, who was diagnosed with type two diabetes in 2021. And her last A1C was 7.4. Her new PCP wants to switch her from metformin to trulicity, but she wanted to try a starch dominant low fat diet first. Um, but her, but her fasting blood sugars are 199. Uh, she lost, she has 85 pounds to lose to be at a healthy weight. She's 66. What should she tell her PCP? Well, let, let me, let me tell you what, what I would do if uh, she came to the clinic. Uh, the first thing I would do is decide whether or not she's truly a type two or type one and a half diabetic. If she's a type one, which isn't common when people are that overweight, you know, one of the qualities of a type one diabetic is they're death thin because they don't have any insulin to put fat into the fat cells. So they just waste and waste and waste away. So this person being 80 pounds overweight, I can pretty much guess that she has type one and a half or probably type two diabetes. In other words, type two means when she lost the weight, her diabetes would go away completely. So likely after making that judgment, and I likely would say that she is in the category of type two or type one and a half. I would stop most, if not all of her insulin. I would stop all of her pills. I don't, I'm sorry. Uh, she was on, she was on metformin and switched to Trulicity. That, the doctor uh, wants to switch her, right? I, I would stop the metformin. We always, we stop metformin essentially hundred percent of the time with people who come to our clinic. It's a useless drug. It, it, it you know, it, it doesn't cause weight gain. And that's why doctors prescribe it. That it, That's the one criteria. Criterion is it doesn't cause weight gain. And it kind of acts like GLP-1 agonist. It destroys your appetite. So you end up losing weight. Well, you know, if that's reflected a reduction of risk of heart disease, so be it. But there are a lot of safer ways to, ways to lose weight. So anyway, uh, metformin glucophage is... Uh, about about probably half the people who are diabetic are on that drug. It's uh, they're being lied to basically uh, by not being told the truth, lies by admission. Anyway, you can look it up. Hey, you look at my lecture on diabetes on YouTube. Just look up McDougal and diabetes on YouTube, and uh, you'll you'll find all the stuff that I was telling you about. Thanks. This is from Anonymous and she's 81 years old. And after um, her second COVID vaccination, 
she had something, um, she experienced a SCAD heart attack as a C a CAD heart attack, as well as a stroke. She has weak and torturous blood vessels in her brain and heart. Can they be helped or cured with a plant-based diet? Yep. The answer is yes. It can be helped tremendously. And the work to look at would be Kempner's work. Again, it's in my December, 2013 newsletter. Yeah, you can, you can help this uh, retinop or this, these vascular problems. If you look at Kempner's work, you'll show that he showed reversal of severe eye damage to the blood vessels. You can actually see the blood vessels if you look in the eye. And it's a simple, simple otoscope, which I've had one of those for the last 55 years. It's just a little, a little thing you look through. You, know, you look in the back of the eye, you know, no electricity, no, no bells and whistles. You just look through the back, through the back and, and you can see the blood vessels. And looking at the blood vessels, which are the same blood vessels that are in the kidney, same blood vessels that are in the brain, same blood vessels every place, except you can only see them directly by looking in the eye. And what Kepler showed is by eating the Kepler diet, he was able to reverse diabetic retinopathy in about half the cases. So it's your only chance. You did not get the torturous blood vessels by catching COVID. It had nothing to do with it. Now, you may have an increased risk of dying from COVID because of your poor health. Now, people who have comorbid factors, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease, lung disease, in other words, comorbid, morbid being dead, they had it when they were just about dead, comorbid, okay? They have an increased risk of dying, an increased risk of being placed on a mechanical ventilator and drowning in their fluids for two weeks before they die and being hospitalized. So yeah, you the fact that you had COVID and you got poor health, they combine together, but they make the, the COVID virus much more deadly because you can't defend as well because your, your body's not healthy. You don't defend. What would you expect? Anyway, you can fix that. And what I would do, the way I would approach it if you came to the clinic is uh, if, I, if I've got all this correct on this one patient is I would stop or reduce. I would stop all the pills. I always stop all the pills. When people come in, I always stop all the pills. And then what I do is I would uh, reduce her insulin if she was taking it, but I realize she's not. I'd reduce the insulin and uh, maybe stop it. I don't know. Be my best guess. But I'll be right there. I'll be there the next morning to see what your blood sugar is. And if it wasn't a good idea, we'll change it. We'll put you back on some medicine. You know, that's the luxury, uh, the advantage of having people at the 12 day telemedicine programs. We are, we're with you all day long. Mm -hmm. Starting in the morning, Tiffany and, uh, and Stacy, they get up with you in the morning and they get you going. You know, get, get you started on your recipes. Find out what your blood sugar is, your blood pressure, how you're feeling today. And this continues for a whole year after you leave the program. Well, you still have a few openings in January and she's 81. I'm curious, what's the oldest person that's ever taken your program? And oh, what is the youngest? Probably 95. Youngest, wow. they'd have to come with their parents and probably five, six, seven years old. Nice. That's amazing that it's open to all ages. So we only have, we only have two two spots for the January program. Is that what Heather does? That's amazing. Two spots left. So some of you guys that are asking these questions, jump on it now. All uh, I can say is that we are we are being noticed, and so the programs are a little more difficult to get in. So I would sign up early, yep. and um, yeah, and then get it started. Get, look, you're gonna look back. Just like so many other things in life, you're going to look back and you're going to say, why didn't I do this before? Why did I wait so long? Why did I wait so long? And you will do that, I assure you, just like when I quit smoking. Yeah. Why did I wait so long? You know, I should, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, so Jim says, Dr. McDougall, what's your opinion for people that are prescribed warfarin? Can we get off this drug if we go fully whole food plant-based? Yes. Yes, you can. Uh, well, let me tell you what you do is you go to the internet, you look up a, uh, a algorithm called CHADS, capital C, capital H, capital A, capital D, and maybe a bigger or a small S. 
it's CHADS. It, it's an acronym for cholesterol and a bunch of other stuff. Age, high blood pressure, stroke, et cetera. Anyway, what, what it is, is this, is this uh, uh, algorithm which helps predict whether you're going to have more benefits or harms from taking Coumadin. And what it says in general is if you're a healthy person, you shouldn't be taking Coumadin or Eliquis or any of these other thinning drugs because your risk of having a stroke is so small. But if you're a sick person, then, and they define sick as being over the age of 70 or 75, I refuse to be put in that category because I'm 76. So I don't give myself any points for that. <laughs> but if you've had a stroke, which I have, I get two points. If you, uh, anyway, you add these points up and if you score zero or one, you should not be on the drugs. That's standard doctor's recommendations. This is nothing that you'll hear differently from anybody else you talk to who knows how to take care of a patient with atrial fib. Chad, C-H-A-D-S. Look it up. All right. So uh, you do just fine without the blood thinning drugs, reduce risk of stroke compared to bleeding problems when you take the drugs. Anyway, you do that. You keep your heart rate uh, in general below 110 beats per minute. If it's not slow enough, you start a beta blocker, digoxin, and then you eat good food. You know, I always have to add that. Yeah, yeah. Joan's asking, is is the warning for warfarin the same as for Prodexa? No, I don't think so. I think Prodexa is a, something like, oh, like Aliquis. Okay. These are these non coumadin drugs. Nice. Here's somebody that thinks they knew you named I. Coumadin is rat poison. It's warfarin. It's what yeah. you use to kill the rats in your basement. Oh my God. They come along and they eat the warfarin and they die. They bleed to death. What do you think this drug does? Oh my God, that sounds so scary. But but I, I think it does reduce the chance of having a stroke, AJ. And I think people should pay attention to the CHADS formula and get the, take the best guess they can. Ladies and gentlemen, your doctor is just guessing. Your doctor is not God. Your doctor does not know the future. Your doctor is just guessing and hopefully he or she is a good guesser. Now I'm a good guesser. I've been at this for 55 years taking care of 12,000 people. I, I've got a lot of experience. And so my, but it's just guessing. All I'm doing is guessing because I don't know the future, nor does anybody else. So your doctor may guess based on the chance formula that your chances will be better if you take the Coumadin. And that's based on a lot of math. And then you got to decide, do you believe his guess or would you rather go with a different guess? Because, you know, in that group of people who need to be on Coumadin, some bleed to death or have hemorrhagic strokes. If you're in that group where you take the Coumadin, you have a stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, or you bleed from gastrointestinal wound, what, what, what do you say? Do you say taking Coumadin was good for you? It killed you. Oh, I didn't know that. I was guessing it wouldn't. Yeah, you were, you were guessing that it wouldn't, but it did because it was just a guess. But that you got to rely on guesses. You have to rely on your doctor being a good, giving you good recommendations. That's what they call it is good prescriptions. But it's just good guesses. I'm going to give you this blood pressure pill and it is going to cause you to be impotent and weak and pee all the time. But I think it's worth it. My guess is that it's worth it because of the reduction in stroke that it might give you, which is, by the way, almost nothing. <clears throat> anyway, it's just a guess. So this lady thinks she might have known you. Her name is Eileen. And she says, are you the same doctor who would go windsurfing on the opposite side of Oahu in the mornings and then see his patients in the afternoon? I lived in Honolulu from 1982 to 85. I hear you yeah. at a good reputation. And I always wanted to make an appointment with you, but I was too busy. I hung out with Bob Kiyosaki's group and you probably knew Randy, the artist that lived on that side too. Any of these ring a bell? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I've went there for 30 years. Whenever I had a tough time, AJ, you know, I'd have a patient that wasn't doing well, or, you know, I maybe got some critique from one of my colleagues and, you know, it bothered me terrible. I, I couldn't think about anything else until I got my board out. And then when I got up on my board and I started uh, uh, surfing through the waves, moving along at 34 miles an hour, I didn't have any more problems. 
I didn't have any worries. All I thought about was staying on that board. But yeah, I'm the guy. Uh, I used to ha have a home that was seven houses from the beach. I could get from my garage in the morning. I used to do it. She mentioned it. I would get up before the sunshine, before daybreak, and I would get my my rig, my sail, and my boom, my mast under my left arm. And I would put my board under my right arm and I'd walk seven houses down to the beach and I would rig up. It took me seven minutes. But I was rigged after seven minutes and the sun was just starting to come up. And then I'd take off. Just barely enough sunlight to see the next wave ahead of you. Or behind you. I have to tell you, that's one of the most enjoyable things I've ever done. I used to have a big boat, sailboat, a world-class boat. I'd go out on that boat and the wind would start blowing. I'd go, wow, I wish I had my windsurfer. It was so much more fun. Same thing when I when I, when I was flying airplanes. Uh, Mary and I are both pilots. We'd go over uh, we'd go over Bodega Bay and I'd look out there and you know, we'd be doing all kinds of practices and stalls and a bunch of other deadly stuff with the airplanes. And I'd look down there at Bodega Bay and see the, my friends windsurfing. And I'd say, I'd like to go back early so I could go windsurfing. That was me. But, um, you know, those, those days are likely over. So hmm. maybe, maybe not. I, I, people ask me whether I'd go out windsurfing again. I haven't been in a while. Because, did, you, let's face what, it, did you just like bring a lunch with you? Like and stay out all day? You no, know, my house was just seven. Oh, okay. Seven houses from the beach. So I'd go home and eat. Yeah. Susanna's saying you've had such a fascinating life and she wishes you would write an autobiography. Yeah. Well, I thought about it, you know, but mainly because my children would like to have, uh, you know, a testimony of what Mary and I did in our early lives. And so I thought about writing a autobiography. Uh, based, you know, we have had a, an amazing life. So, so enjoyable. We've been so fortunate. You know, that's the thing as I think about there's so many bad things could have happened to us along the way. And somehow or another, you know, we've been riding the the right wave in the cosmos and we've been real lucky we've had a great job great marriage great sports enough money to do the things we wanted to do so no i, I just even hate talking about it because i'm worried that the next shoe will drop you know to start bragging about how good your life is good god it can turn around in a second well i mean you've been through some tough times i mean the fire most people would have crumbled with that if that happened to them well i guess i you know i didn't mention the fire so you can tell that it really, really didn't change me much. Uh, it was, it was, a, it probably did. It probably did. I, I just do have, I've not, I have not dealt with it yet. It was six years ago and I'm still, still working on it. Wow. I think I'll let that go. <laughs> Wasn't my fault. I didn't, I didn't start the fire. You didn't start the fire. I'd love to see a documentary yeah. of, your, of your life. Um, it, was, so it was an experience, uh, AJ. You know, it's just been lately that we thought back that we almost died. You know, for the first two or three years, we never thought about that. But from the time our grandkids came into our bedroom until the house was was in flames was five minutes. Five minutes. That's so scary. I got, out of there, I got out of there with my computer. Mary got out with her phone. She, she didn't have her glasses, so she couldn't see. And, uh, you know, we, we were just glad that we weren't in the inferno. But we did start thinking about that we could have been dead like and only recently we even thought about that possibility and then you think about everything you lost you know we've lost material things an awful lot but they were material things you know nobody got hurt so that was pretty easy to get over with and besides that i took the attitude how many people get to start their life over at age 70 yeah and and how many people are generous enough to spare their children and grandchildren cleaning out the attic yeah. I didn't I didn't have to clean the attic or the basement. Good way of you looking know, at it. You see these these see the, the, this this Maui thing, the Hawaii uh, uh fires that just happened a couple of months ago. Uh, this really started Mary and I thinking about what we went through because we saw it from um, a distance and we could, you know, put ourselves into this reality because our home looked just like their homes. You know, it was the same same smoldering pieces of metal sticking up out of the ground. That was it. You know, we lost 50 people who died in our neighborhood. 
So I, the Molly fires have really started me thinking about uh, a lot of things that I've you know, tr tried to suppress, I guess. Eli says, I'm eating the starch to loosen whey, but all the time I have sores around my nose. What could cause sores outside and inside of my nose and how do I get rid of them? I, I would think about a bacterial infection and get some Neosporin or see a dermatologist. That'd be the best thing to do. See if they have some kind of antibiotic cream or something. But those, those sores that are outside the nose are usually due to crusting, due to you know constant dripping of, of uh, nasal material. And then bacteria grow in there and they get infected. And so I, I think probably you have a good chance of getting some antibiotic cream, like say new neosporin, which you buy in the drugstore. And uh, seeing a dermatologist would be a much more definitive way to approach the problem. So I don't think it's a dietary problem. I don't think it's a dietary disease. Oh, Dr. McDougal <laughs> said that something wasn't a dietary disease. Come on. Oh, it's a good point as well. Coincidence. Mary says, could eating too many nuts be a contributor to higher cholesterol levels? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. I think that research that's out there shows that nuts and seeds don't raise cholesterol. But I'll take a look at it between now and the next time we get together. I, you know, I, I try and keep up with things, but there are a lot of stuff that I haven't reviewed in a while. So oh, that's yeah. a good question. One um one of the live viewers is saying, does cooking a starch and putting it in the refrigerator overnight help a diabetic? Help that? Oh, I know. Dr. Gregor talks about that. Mm -hmm. And he talks about how when you refrigerate carbohydrates, they turn into a less a less absorbable source of calories. I don't know. But he 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 mentions uh, I don't know that it's a starch, but putting certain vegetables in cold water to bring out uh, the more stable starch, which is likely to be the starch that's less absorbed that is left in the intestine, goes out as dietary fiber. But you no, know, we don't ever do that. We never refrigerate our foods for any health aspect. I think it's more, I think, uh, you know, Dr. Gregor has a way of looking at some details that may not be really relevant to the overall picture. I mean, yes, these things do that, uh, and, and, you know, what he reported, he does a really good job or very accurate. But as far as the relevance to people, you know, I, you don't need to know that, you know, cranberry juice has extra NADLF C24 in it. You don't need to know that. You just need to know that starches, vegetables, and fruits are good for you. And you want to you get off the darn drugs if you can. If yeah. you come to our program, we might put you on some drugs because I got a prescription pad. I'm a real doctor. So is Dr. Lim. We're going to put you on drugs. We're going to take you off 20 drugs for every one we put you on, though. <laughs> That's neat. Uh, um, yeah, you, know, you, you would think, AJ, that somebody in the medical profession would figure out that it's good not to take pills. But that's not how we were educated. We were educated that these people, once they're on the blood pressure or the diabetic pills, they're on for the rest of their life. Don't you ever think about reducing them? That's what the drug companies have taught your doctors, is that you're on these for a lifetime. And, you, and most of you are too, because you're seeing the same doctors and following the same advice. But uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's uh, the, the generation out there is to make as much money as you can, as quick as you can, without killing people outright. So the, the public around you sees that you're killing people. You gotta keep it kind of low. You know, you're keep funny. Hearing. You're funny, Doctor McDougall. You have a way with words. Um, well, you know, I, I have to be that way. Otherwise, it becomes it becomes too serious, AJ. You know, you you sit and you think, how could this, something like this be something that he jokes about? You know, it's my health. So I have to be real careful about the line between, you know, giving you good advice and being a smart A, smart A. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Okay, so Marilyn says the so-called experts say that we need to eat more healthy fats, protein, and less starchy foods and control our carbohydrates to uh, to prevent insulin resistance. What say you? Uh, I don't think you listen to this person anymore because they have an inadequate understanding of the science. And, and, and 99.9999% of people who ever walk this earth obtain the bulk of their calories from starch. Fight that statistic. That's 107 billion people. 
Do you think they all have made a mistake and should decrease the amount of starch in their diet? We probably wouldn't have survived as a human species if, if this kind of uh, expert advice had gotten out to the public. They, they couldn't fight battles. They couldn't raise their kids. They wouldn't have enough energy. You know, so somebody somebody in some village would say, hey, you know, we, we eat lots of beans and rice and corn and so on. But, but, but the next village over, they're going to go on a low carb diet or, or maybe not so bad. They're going to go on a portion control diet. You know what would happen? This village over here that eats starchy vegetables and fruits, you know what they're going to do to that village? Destroy them. You know what they're going to do to the men in that village? You know what's going to happen to your women in that village? They're going to take those carbohydrate calories and put them to good use. Bad use, but good use. Look, don't be stupid about things when you, you, you fail to look at the big picture. Don't talk to me about details, especially if you've got them wrong. Look, ask your doctors to provide the evidence that supports their point of view. And the more specific you can be, the better off you are. And if you don't have that, that challenge in second opinion, if you don't have Dr. McDougall's medicine book, a challenge in second opinion, then you better start there. Because I'll give you a second opinion that's drastically different than the one you're likely getting in your doctor's office. And I'll give you the science to show you that I'm right and they're wrong. And likely I'm not going to be making many mistakes either because if I did, somebody would be out there going to let me know about it. So I got to work. I, I still have to work pretty hard. At 76 years old, I probably do, probably do about three hours of uh, literature search every day. Wow. Thank you for yeah. that. Um, well, you know, I, I got to keep up, uh, AJ, and it's so interesting to me. That That's the thing about medicine is I love it. You know, I read research papers. Mary reads novels. I seriously do. I, I, I take at least 13 journals. And I start in the morning, I start reading this paper and that paper and so on. Because I find it so interesting. I just love it. And then I have a chance to transfer what I learned to you guys. Great. Sheba says, if somebody's open to trying the diet, but maybe can't make all the changes at once, which is more important, the elimination of animal food or the elimination of oil? Oh, boy, that's a good one. I think, well, I, I think what I would do is this, is I would recommend that they start with the dairy because they're going to get such a profound effect when they stop the cheese and the ice cream and the milk, if, if that's a dominant part of their diet. So I would start with there. I, I would go to the meat next, and then I would go to the oil next. But for, as far as me ranking them in order of toxicity, they're all equally toxic. And maybe it's because people, I think, would be, would find it easier to give up the dairy because of our our society. You know, dairy is kind of treats, They're, you know, special things, whereas meat is the center of the meal. So uh, I think that people would find it easier to give up dairy and really important as far as the results that they get. And then what happens is they get the diet, they get the dairy out, they get all the meat out and they go, why am I not losing weight? This McDougall diet just doesn't work. Well, it's because of lipotoxicity. Lipotoxic, you're being poisoned by fat. And until you stop the vegetable oil, the fish oil, the flaxseed oil, the pig oil, the cow oil, you're going to, the milk oil, you're going to stay in poor health. Lipotox Nathan Pritikin used to call it lipotoxicity. Uh, and, you know, he, he probably put more emphasis on that word than anything else was uh, lipotoxicity. Well, speaking of fat, Joyce is saying, with, if one doesn't have a gallbladder, are there foods that we should limit or avoid? Yeah, definitely you should avoid high fat foods because they'll cause gallbladder pain. And if you've lost the gallbladder, what happens is you end up producing a tremendous amount of bile acids from the liver. Because remember, the job of bile acids, which are made in the liver, is to digest fat that you eat. So the more fat you eat, the more bile acids you make. Bile acids are very irritating. They're acids. 
Okay, so when you make a lot of bile acid because you're eating oil and fat, et cetera, and that's why you will, because that's the job of bile acids to digest fat, you're going to be making a lot of bile acids that are no longer stored in your gallbladder because your gallbladder is gone. Used to be between meals, the, the, the bile would be sequestered in this balloon called a gallbladder. And then, then when the meal came along, the gallbladder would contract and squeeze the bile juices on the food and a little sphincter called od odi a little sphincter called od opens up and the stuff it, it kind of squirts on the food but when you don't have a gallbladder or a cystic duct there's no place to store the bile so between meals it just drips and drips and drips and causes chronic diarrhea half the people have had their gallbladder out still have severe abdominal distress. After the surgery, diarrhea, epigastric pain, etc. But if they would change their diet, then those symptoms would go away. The diarrhea would stop. The risk of colon cancer would be decreased. You see, bile acids are converted into cancer-causing substances in the, in, the, in the large intestine as a consequence of growing bad bacteria. So when you grow bad probiotics, unhealthy probiotics, you know, the, e the, the, the gram-positive bacteria, you know, the guys that love to eat meat and dairy, when you do that, you convert other substances like nitrosamines into powerful cancer-causing chemicals. You want to reduce the amount of bile acid in your intestinal tract, the amount of bile acid your liver makes. What will happen is if you don't reduce the amount of fat in your diet is you'll have severe diarrhea, likely. The man's name is an Andreessen, spelled S-E-N, Andreessen, that's the end, okay? He's uh, published in a journal called Gut between 1971 and 1973. Just look it up, Andreessen and uh, low-fat diets and chronic diarrhea, you know, this, this man, this researcher back in the 1970s and the article's on my website, by the way. People who take the course get access to all of my scientific articles, at least the ones that found, were the foundation of the McDougall program. What, what, what Andreessen discovered is he'd take people with 20 watery stools a day, and he put them on a low-fat diet, and within a day or two, you know, 48 to 72 hours, they would, they would reduce their frequency of bowel movements to one to three solid bowel movements a day just by stopping the bile acid irritation caused by the fatty diet. So if you've lost your gallbladder and you're st still having problems, likely you gotta kind of fix your diet. Th those bile acids, they uh, are irritating to the large intestine. So people who've had their gallbladder out have three times the risk of right-sided colon cancer. If you eat a healthy diet, you eat low fat, which reduces the production of bile acids, and you eat high fiber, which complexes the bile acids in the gut and deactivates them. That's it? Okay. All right. And uh, here we have Wendy. Are, should we be concerned about fluoride? Does it affect nutrient absorption? I, I don't know about nutrient absorption, but I'm confident it does. Uh, it, it has to have an interaction with other minerals. You know, fluoride is a mineral. Uh, fluoride, you know, fluoride was discovered in the drinking water back again when I was a child. And we ended up getting fluoride treatments where they take solutions of fluoride, put them on a, on a cloth and stick them around your teeth. That's how we got the treatments back then. Didn't take pills or capsules or vitamins for drinking water. We we had our whole tooth covered by uh, little sponges full of fluoride. Anyway, they discovered it reduces the risk of cavities. So it was a, a worldwide campaign to cut down on cavities by using fluoride. Well, when they started looking into it further, they found that uh, people who had high fluoride intakes in their, in their well water had higher risk of fractures. Uh, one of the things that I would see as a young doctor is somebody who was treated with fluoride for osteoporosis. We used to do that. We used to treat osteoporosis with fluoride. Why? Because 
when you give somebody fluoride, the bones light up. They look like they're they look like they're solid concrete. They just shine from the fluoride. And so you would think that it reflects a whole bunch of strength. But these bones of people who've been treated with fluoride, they break, they break like a porcelain plate when you hit the ground. They have no strength to them. So anyway, I, I, I think if you're going to take fluoride, you want to take advantage of the benefits, which are small amounts. And you ought to either give your family vitamin pills or depend upon the drinking water or uh, toothpaste, but not a combination of all of them. The difference between toxicity and therapy is not much when it comes to fluoride. So you have to be very careful that you don't run into a toxic dose by giving multiple sources. If you give too much fluoride, in addition to increased fractures, there's worry about an increased risk of cancer. And, and there's something called chiclet teeth. Or the front enamel of your teeth looks like it has chiclets on it. You know, remember those little gum things, chiclets? Well, they, they, you develop a very thick enamel from fluoride. They, you'll see it in the kids. Just look around, you'll see it. Yeah. Anyway, that's yep. why I don't. Interesting. This is from Barbara. She's 71 years old, 30 years living with RA, and now complication of ILD, including pulmonary nodules. Will this diet help reduce inflammation? What's ILD? Uh, 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 idiopathic liver disease? I don't know. I'm guessing. I don't know. I, I can Google it. I, I'm guessing. I'm just... She's got lung, lung nodules and what else? She's had rheumatoid arthritis. For rheumatoid years. arthritis for 30 years. Let What is ILD? Interstitial no, no. lung disease. How do you like that? Interstitial lung disease. That, that would be okay. That's an inflammatory process, similar to what the joints undergo. But one of the things you'll learn uh, in medical school, or if you get this disease is that uh, rheumatoid arthritis doesn't just affect the joints. It affects the lungs, it affects the eyes, it affects many areas in the body that are susceptible to autoimmune diseases. Because this is an autoimmune disease that affects the entire body, not, not just the joints, that happens to be where it's most obvious is in the painful joints, but it's getting your eyes, it's getting your salivary glands, it's getting your lungs, these antibodies are going every place in the body, not just to the joints. And they're causing inflammatory reactions that eventually lead to scars. Interstitial lung disease would be, in my thinking, the scars related to chronic inflammation. That would be, that's what I would think of in terms of interstitial lung disease. So the answer is no, I don't think it's gonna get a lot better. I'm pretty sure your nodules are not gonna go away. And it's likely having had rheumatoid arthritis for 30 years is that you are what we call a burnt out rheumatoid patient. You know what that means? That means you have destroyed all your joint tissue. So there's nothing left to become inflamed. So the pain is reduced because the joints are gone, basically. So it's, it's burned out rheumatoid arthritis is what the terminology is. Wow. And, uh, and, and, and it doesn't hurt. The joints, once they get burned out, don't hurt anymore, AJ. They're just scars. Of course, they're immobile and they're deformed. And, yeah. So it would have been nice if you would started this earlier. But I have to tell you, in a research paper published in The Lancet back in uh, about the early 1980s, showed that with the best therapy available, you know, which is not much different than what we have today, the best therapies available that half the patients who have rheumatoid arthritis are dead or seriously disabled after 20 years of disease. This person's done 32 years. So, you know, very positive. She's done well. well half the people by, by 20 years of disease, you know, they're in big trouble. Wow. And the other people are in trouble too. It's the food. It's the food. Until you prove me otherwise, it's the food. You know, it could be a virus. It could be something else, but I doubt it. It's the food. Well, speaking of the food, here's a fun question from a dentist and a name Maria. And she says, I love the McDougal diet, but I'm super gassy. Does this go away on its own? I'm a dentist and I don't want to be gassy and I don't want to take Beano either. Yeah. They're called, McBu they're called McBuglers, right? Mc McBuglers, yeah. You've heard a good McBugle today. <laughs> or, when, or when we walk, we talk. Uh, yeah, you have more gas. Uh, my August 2002 newsletter 
talks about how you deal with the gas. Uh, first of all, you avoid all beans, peas, and lentils or any other foods that you think are troublesome. But beans, peas, and lentils have sugar in them that our gut won't digest. And so as the sugars pass through the gut, the bacteria digest those sugars and turn them into gases. So that's why you get all the gas on digested plant foods. Um, how, do you, how do you make things better? Well, you could take activated charcoal. I think that works. We, don't, we haven't talked about that much. Uh, Agatha Thrash used to use that back in, in her program in Alabama. But we'll talk about Agatha Thrash someday. Um, yeah, I've never heard of her. I've never heard of her. Was she an Adventist or? She was an Adventist, yeah. yeah. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. Well, well she did a program almost like ours, but she used some of the other Adventist philosophies like hy hy uh, hyperthermia treatment where it put people in uh, baths of very hot water and raised their body temperature. And a lot, a lot of uh, a sh showers with multiple shower heads. Uh, you know, it, it's quite a problem to see. U Uchi Pines, that was the name of the place. U U Uchi Pines, U-C-C-H-I Pines. It's still, I think it's still there and I think they're still doing programs. Yeah, well, I wouldn't be surprised. Agatha Thrash, I think, died though. I knew Agatha Thrash. Nice. Well, I, I listen, I, I know all of these people. Because I grew up with them, I learned from them. Uh, this was my time. Uh, the, the the issues on food and medicine and surgeries all have have been worked out and studied and so on. We have to go on to another whole form of different medicine to make any any real differences because we've explored this idea of treating chronic diseases with pills to death. We, we got to figure out something else because it's not working. Your friends are still sick. Your relatives are still sick. You're still taking drugs. It's not working. So why don't we try something different? I mean, we tried drug therapy. We tried surgical therapy. We tried music therapy. Why don't we try diet therapy? Why don't we do that? Maybe that could be important since every day you've taken one to three pounds of your environment since uh, diet is the number one discussed issue in health worldwide. I mean, wh why don't we just try a diet? Let's just try a little diet therapy. Let's do that for the 21st century. I think so. You guys help me, okay? You guys help me, okay? Please help me. I, I, I've been at this for a long time, and I have to say that the progress I've made has been less than I thought I would do. I thought I was going to be a big shot knowing all this stuff. And it's turned out I'm not a big shot. I'm hard, hardly even get people's attention. So, Well, the the, the uh, ACLM and plantrician think you're a big shot. Yeah, well, they did, but they're biased. Ah! You know, wait until, the, wait until the American College of Surgeons or the American College of Cardiology honors me with a Lifetime Achievement Award in diet. Wait until that happens. Or the American College of Gynecology and Obstetricians. And you you seem to take it very well that, that I mean, we all love you and agree with you, but a lot of your colleagues, they're harsh on you and you seem to be so resilient against their criticism. Is it because you know in your heart you're right? I think so. I, 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 I hate to be, to sound uh, like I'm bragging or, you know, got some ego problem, but hey, ladies and gentlemen, I worked really hard. Now, I spent six years developing this diet. I read everything I could get my hands on. So yeah, I, I think I'm pretty darn close to right. And, and the way I challenge you is this. I believe that we have what is closest to the human diet, the McDougall diet. In other words, if you ask what will be the best diet to feed human beings to make them live, function, and feel the best they can, it'd be a starch-based diet. But if you don't believe that, if you think you're going to improve on it, then show me. Yeah, show, show me how you can make it better. I did this when I was first developing the diet uh, back 47 years ago. I, I would take a basic starch-based diet, you know, say beans or rice or potatoes, and I'd add some fruits and vegetables, and I'd look at the vitamin A and the vitamin C and the protein and the fats and when I got all done, I found that this pile of food, starch, especially with fruits, showed no suggestion of inadequacy, no nutritional problems. Okay, 
So then what I did is I said, well, let's see if what happens if we add some other things to this basic program. Well, let's let's try a little dairy. Because they tell me, and really, I'm serious. I'm not joking about how I went through this. So uh, I, I put a little dairy into the equation. And uh, yes, it gave you more calcium. But I learned that there's no such thing as dietary calcium deficiency. Never been reported. You grow elephants, hippopotamus, giraffes on, on plants. Okay, so I said, well, what, what would that? Okay, we had, we got calcium. What else would we get from dairy? I can't think of anything. Calories. Calcium and calories, that's what we get. But what did we get on the downside? Environmental pollution. Uh, micro, microbe infections like mad cow and E. coli and staphylococcus. We get into a problem of excess dietary fat, particularly saturated fat, which promotes artery disease. We get into a problem of excess protein, particularly when you eat low fat dairy. And then you have problems with the liver, kidneys, and bones. So what did I do to my pile of food that either made it better or worse by adding dairy or meat or oil or egg? You know, I went through all of these disciplines. And what the equation came out was you would be worse off if I added these things to the basic starch-based meal plan with fruits and vegetables. Now, getting to kind of a final point here is, ladies and gentlemen, no, let me start this way. You need to know what the diet is of a human being. You, if you have dogs, you know what your dogs eat. You have birds, you know what birds eat. You have racehorses, you know what racehorses eat. You know exactly because you care about these animals. Why don't you know what the diet is for, for your four-year-old daughter or, or, or your 10-year-old ten, athletic son or your 60-year-old uh aging man or woman you know anyway anyway uh, i i i had to figure out what was the best i could feed you if you think you can make the starch based diet fruits and vegetables any better by adding anything supplement pills etc then show me now, i realized that you know you got a plugged heart artery you're not going to fix it overnight with potatoes and you will break up the blockage in a matter of an hour with an angioplasty catheter. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about overall good health. That's how I developed the program. I wasn't interested in making you happy. That wasn't my goal. My goal was as a physician to help you heal. And that's what I've been doing the last 47 years. Is I've been taking everything I know that I can apply to you, whether it's science or it's social or it's family or whatever, and, and I try and uh, I try and get you to do this. So, it's the best diet there is for a human being. I believe so. Show me otherwise. I Add something to the program that makes it better. <laughs> I don't even want to go there. What I, uh, some people think, but you know what I'm thinking, right? No, no. Tell me what you're thinking. Well, no, your diet's great, but it's too low in fat. You got to add nuts and you got to add, okay, you know. Well, you you got to add nuts. How about saltless nuts? Are, are they okay? Can can we eat? How about raw almonds? Would that be okay? Or you say that isn't as good as my salted um, almonds in my jar that I get with a lot of grease on them. Well, I guess so. But if you like the salt, it's not the grease that you like. I mean, consider consider this experiment. Well, consider, first of all, that uh, we have some very negative terms about fat. Uh, for example, uh, what do we call a restaurant with a bad reputation? Greasy spoon. And, and when you get uh, oil on your kitchen counter or your face or hands, you always wash it off with strong detergents because it feels so horrible. Well, why do you have this kind of association with fats and oils? They're all negative. There's nothing positive that you can tell me, except that the fats and oils help stick the salt to the French fries and potato chips and the sugar to stick to the donuts. You won't drink a cup of safflower oil. You won't drink a cup of olive oil. If it's so darn good, why don't you drink a half a cup of fish oil? You're not gonna do it, it's disgusting. So why do you tell me that it's the fat you miss? It's not the fat you miss. I mean, you, you may have to go through some habit changing. <laughs> anyway. Mm.
So yeah, I, 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 I can't relate to what you're saying, except that everybody says it. So, yep. you know, so common response. Here's a, not- oh, sorry. Here's a stumper from Aditi. She says, Dr. McDougall, I've been on a starch-based, completely vegan, very low salt, oil, sugar-free diet for years, except when I travel one week in Europe and six weeks in Korea, when I ate a regular diet with fish, but no meat. I lost 20 pounds over four years and was doing a stress-free, wonderful job when suddenly on December 14th, 2022, I had a left pontine stroke that left my right side paralyzed. I'm 63, had slightly elevated blood pressure of 140 over 90, cholesterol 234, glyceride 74 hdl 68 ldl 150 on 51 was on no medication i'm not obese never had drugs once uh maybe al- uh, in six months social alcohol do mild exercise my neurologist was stumped asked me to continue my good habits where did i go wrong well you, you know you, where you went wrong is you aged <laughs> you know uh, the, the body parts start to wear out as you get older and what you did wrong was your behavior prior to four years ago. You know, all that damage builds up. And so as a consequence, I, if, if you've heard me say that if you follow a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables, you're going to reverse everything and be like you were when you were 17 years old with function, feelings, and beauty of a 70-year-old. Uh, that's not what I'm promising. What I'm promising is that you're going to stop the inflammation. You're going to stop the damage. You're going to be left with scar tissue. You're going to be left with lesions in your pontine artery of your brain that maybe have been ready to pop four years ago and you delayed them from popping by three years. You know, I mean, these things add up. And then there's bad luck and the wrath of God, which I have no control over. But if you think you're going to live forever in perfect shape by following the McDougal diet, you're listening to the wrong channel. I've never tried to tell you that. If you're listening to an opportunity to get your health back more than anything else you can do, it's a food. Yep. So we have another gas question from Anonymous. It's not just bad gas, but it's really stinky. What do you do if your gas is stinky and is Beano okay? Yeah, Beano's okay. Actually, we don't use Beano because it's made from fish products. We use something else. It's a vegetarian Beano preparation. Yeah, it'd be fine. Uh, why does it stink bad? Well, most of the time, the uh, the the bad farts is because meat meat stinks. It smells like something died. That's usually the reason. In other words, it's something in your in your uh, diet, or there's an adjustment that needs to take place in your gastrointestinal metabolism so that you're prepared to eat all these carbohydrates. Give it some time. You know, give it a few weeks and see if that smelly gas goes away. Particularly if you're off of the animals. You know, yeah. what might happen, uh, AJ, is, is like you're, you're not as efficient as at digesting carbohydrates. It takes a little practice and, and you're better at it. So in the time when you're changing over, you have some undigested carbohydrates, which are fermented, you know, into, uh, into various stinky gases. So again, give it some time. Give it time to let the ball bacteria adjust. How long? Two or three weeks should be enough. Yeah. WD says, do you think that eating less meals, fewer meals, say two or even one rather than three helps us lose weight? Many famous doctors blame insulin surges for weight gain and suggest we prolong the fasting window as long as possible. But I rarely hear you mention that. Does it not help with weight loss? Well, it it does in a sense. And, And for the mechanisms that were discussed. And that is that if you eat frequently, you have uh, you have less rises and falls in blood sugar and less rises and falls in insulin. So if you take you uh, you measure the 24 hour secretion of insulin, you know how much insulin somebody secreted in 24 hours. If you look at those who gorged, in other words, they had one to three meals a day, compared to those who nibbled or grazed, say 14 times a day, the 24 hour insulin is much less than those who nibble or graze. So yeah, there is some truth to it, but it, the fact is that eating small meals, well, you, you, you're, you're satisfied you know, for longer periods of time. If you just eat two or three gorging meals a day, then you, you gorge and you're stuffed and then you're starving and you go into making 
uh, our fat storage metabolism, and and then and then let's see where you were. You were starving, and then you ate, and you gorged yourself, and you became uncomfortable. Anyway, uh, it's 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 better to lose weight by eating frequently. You should be a nibbler. So, nibbler. And some of the explanation given is true, but not what the one they gave. Do, you know the you, idea. Do you nibble yeah. all day? I, I I find that I just don't like eating all day. I like to do. I mean, I just because I'm too. It's just a, it's distracting. I like to do two, my two meals and maybe a snack. You know. Right. Well, I, I, you know, we, Mary and I eat uh, two or three meals a day. Yeah. And, you know, maybe a snack once or twice a day. That's good. The, 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 the resilience of the body is so great that these small differences like gorging versus nibbling are irrelevant. The important thing is that you eat a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. I don't care what time of the day you eat it. I don't care how many times of the day you eat it. I don't care how much you eat. I just care what you eat. I just, all I care about is that on your plate are starches, vegetables, and fruits with no added oil and no animals. And most of the food starch. That's so easy. Yeah, so few do it, right? But, but everybody's been doing it, AJ. 106 billion people have done it on planet Earth in the last million years. Why is it so hard? That's all that was available was starch. Because we have hyper palatable processed food now and people just seem to enjoy it despite the consequences. What, what they do is they focus on things that we were designed to enjoy. Remember the salt tasting taste by the tip of the tongue. Remember the sugar tasting taste by the tip of the tongue. There's something called mouthfeel that I never understood, but somehow or another eating fat is supposed to make it feel better to have food in your mouth. Certainly doesn't taste any better. So I, I, I again, you know, it's interesting to go into some of these details just to uh, to deal with the subject. But I hate to get people focusing on the details. Mm -hmm. I, I just rather you think back. Okay, let's see. If I eat more broccoli and cauliflower, I'm going to lose more weight. Yeah, you will. But what you really need to get fixed first is you eat a starch-based diet with broccoli. And then we start messing around with the number of non-starchy vegetables and then starchy vegetables. So I worry that I lose the power of my message by going into details. Even though they're all, you know, most of them have relevance and there's a little truth to everything. It's just that you go, oh, you know, that, 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 he's, he's, he's giving me the little secret, the little gimmick that I didn't realize that I have to little, add a little bit of XYZ vegetable and I'll be okay. He's doing that. Listen to him carefully. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not telling you, if you eat a starch-based diet of fruits and vegetables, you'll get well. Because that's the diet of a human being. I think people think it's just too simple. It can't be. Well, then then what we do is, uh, this is, we might as well announce it right here, is that Heather sells at the end of the program uh, pills. Uh, they are green, and they have an M stamped on both sides. The M stands for McDougal or money. And we tell people at the end of the program, all you learned was of great value of interest, but we want you to know, unless you take four of these pills a day, costing $4 a pill, the diet won't work. And nor will Heather be able to put through three, three boys through college. No, I, I'm not gonna sell you a gimmick. No matter how appealing it is, I know it's appealing. I know that it would be much easier to swallow a plate of mashed potatoes along with some miracle asparagus on it. I don't know. We probably talked enough today. <laughs> okay. Well, let's, listen, I'll stay as long as you want because there's so many questions that, that we have going on back <laughs> all the way to February. So it's as much time as you want. Well, I've, I've got, I'm going to be with you in December. Yes, you are. Well, let's, ask, let's answer some fast questions. Okay, what effect does not having a gallbladder have on the body, if anything, asks Davika? Yeah, well, I answered that. Okay, you answered that, all right. Talk to you about the irritation of the bile acids in the colon, which causes diarrhea. I talked to you about the discomfort post cholecystectomy of about half the people being still sick. I talked to you about the colon cancer on the right side of the large intestine being increased, uh, but it's, you know, 
Mm -hmm. I'll talk to you about that. When you lose your gold, you have no more storage stack for the bile acids. They just drip, 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 drip into your large intestine. Thank you. Um, diarrhea, I need... diarrhea, diarrhea. <laughs> Eileen says, AG1 is a supplement with 75 vitamins, mineral, and whole food sourced ingredients. Do you think it's beneficial or necessary? It's a waste of money. Yeah. Nathan Pritikin used to say that, uh, that vitamin and mineral supplements were just making expensive urine. I would say worse than that. The studies show that if you take vitamin supplements, including one a day, which this one is, a one-a-day multivitamin, you increase the risk of death, heart disease, and cancer. That's what happens. And the reason it happens is you create nutritional imbalances. This all makes sense if you just take a minute to understand what goes on. When you flood the system with isolated concentrated nutrients, what happens is you cause severe nutritional imbalance. You disrupt the whole system so that the other nutrients and hormones don't work properly. And as a result, the Cochrane Collaboration says... If you take a pill like was described a moment ago, AJ, that among 1 million people, you have 9,000 extra deaths from the one-day supplement. Makes sense to me. Don't take this stuff. It's, in, it's, it's uh, not in proper balance. It's not the way that nature intended it. But, you know... Yeah, that's a big market. Uh, Lior says, I have a question pertaining to fat loss. If our bodies prefer carbohydrates as food, how or why would our bodies ever switch to using fat? If I'm gobbling down carbs, won't my body just burn carbs? I'm not overweight, but my waist to height ratio is really bad. What am I missing in the equation? Well, I may have missed some of the question, but you're not eating carbs. A low carb diet means you're eating virtually no carbs. So what, what is the question? She says, that she's you know, the question is she said if our bodies prefer carbohydrates as fuel how or why would our bodies ever switch to using fat if i'm well, gobbling so down carbs will my body so, burn carbs i guess maybe she thinks she doesn't burn fat if she's eating carbs maybe well first of all these diets we're talking about are deficient in carbohydrate so when there's no carbohydrate for energy to supply the brain the red blood cells, the kidney cells, the other cells in the body, since there's no sugar, because the body burns sugar as its preferred source of energy, it's called glycolysis. If there's no sugar available, the body has to resort to other sources of energy. It does it in two ways. One way is through gluconeogenesis. Because the body, the red cells, this is red blood cells, the kidney cells, and a few other cells in the body will only burn sugar they won't burn fat at all. So what the body does is it converts protein into sugar called gluconeogenesis. The other thing to note is there are some organs that will burn fat, but only under distress. The brain uses 20% of your daily calorie intake. The brain prefers sugar. But if you don't have sugar because you eat one of these low-carb diets or you're starving, the brain will use fatty acids for energy. The body's a survivor. So anyway, I, I either I didn't understand the question or you didn't really realize that you were eating carbohydrate. The way or, I interpreted it is how does your body, if, if you have fat, if you're eating, I don't know, if you're at, that's how I interpret it. If you're eating carbs, well, how does your body burn fat? But anyway, maybe she could resubmit it. On a low carb diet, you're not eating carbs. Right. But I guess if you're eating the McDougal diet and you're eating carbs, how does your body burn fat? Maybe that's what she wanted to oh, know. But, uh, that, that, let me see if I can get the question. Uh, how does the body lose the extra fat when you switch to the McDougal diet? Yeah, I think that's it. I think that's the question. I've been asked this for 40 years at least. Uh, the body is, uh, is destined to survive. Okay, everything about your body is focused on you staying alive. It's the survival instinct. It applies to people, all animals and populations. It's survival. So everything is gonna be directed to make you a better survival. Car survivor, carrying around an extra 40 pounds of fat doesn't make you better off to survive, does it? I mean, think about it, you know, the saber-toothed tiger is chasing you down the street. 
and you can't have to carry 40 pounds of fat along. What do you think? You're going to be a meal with a saber-toothed tiger. So the body looks at its fat mass and it goes, hey, I got 40 pounds of fat that is keeping me from surviving. What should I do with it? And what it does is it just burns it off. Good. This is uh, a so, you know, you're, you're, the, 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 the miracle of the human body is far beyond my understanding, but I just know it's a big miracle. Nice. This is a fun question, Dr. McDougall. It's not a medical one from Rosemary. Dr. McDougall, how do you feel about YouTubers version of the start solution? Many of them use the word start solution in their video titles, and some of them are entertaining, but they seem to put their own slant on what the start solution is. Do you mind? I don't think I could stop it. Do you ever watch so, any of the people that are? No, I, I, ne I never do. But, you know, most of the people who I, I have seen when I do watch are pretty consistent with the diet. Our Instagram following, uh, Mary will often comment. You know, these people are better at making low fat recipes than I ever was. So the Instagram uh, uh, population that we have is very, very productive uh, as far as recipes go, low fat diet recipes. Nice. Will this diet, will this way of eating help me regain muscle that I've lost due to stress and age? I'm 72. And will it help my eyes? Will it help my retina problems? Well, it might help your eyes. But it's not, it's not going to help you uh, avoid sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is the new pitch from the, the, uh, the protein supplement and the amino acid supplement industry and the meat, dairy, egg, fish industries. That, that's where they put in their, their propaganda. Is they're telling you that you're getting older. Yes, you are. Come on now. Yes, you are. And you're getting trimmer. Come on now. Yes, you are. How many overweight elderly people do you know? Not many, most of them have died off. So, you know, what I'm trying to say is it's normal and natural as you age to carry around less muscle. You don't need as much muscle or to carry less fat. You don't, you don't need to be carrying all this fat around. Now, if you decide you want to gain muscle mass, all the research studies that I'm aware of that look at it from the point of view of not being a seller of these products, in other words, they're not confused or conflicted. All the studies I know show the only way to regain muscle mass is to exercise. Okay, that's it. You've got to put the effort into the muscles to make them bigger and stronger. You can't do it by eating foods. You know, if, if eating foods, like eating muscle, made your muscle bigger and stronger. I mean, that's what they're saying, AJ, is they're saying if you eat these dead chicken, cow, and pig muscles, that you will end up growing more muscle. Well, first of all, it doesn't happen. Second of all, could we carry that analogy on to other organs that need some stimulation? How about, how about if we eat liver to resolve fatty liver disease? Or how about if we eat brains to get smarter? Well, let's see, we could eat bones. Maybe that would help because it's got calcium in it to make the bones stronger. And as far as my sex drive goes, you know, they've been selling mountain oysters for as long as I know. You know what mountain oysters are, AJ? Yes, it's sheep testicles, right? Yeah. Ugh. So if that made you more, more of a commander in the bed, uh, that'd be great, but it doesn't. So you can eat all the sheep testicles you want, and you're not going to be more appreciated by your sex partner than you were now. Oh that'll work that's that'll work i suppose if i wanted to grow more hair i could eat i could eat their hair if i was going bald that's a good i was going i could eat hair or scalp i'll just eat scalp that'd be good well, let's see what else you get the point it's just stupid so yep. bph yeah. the research yeah. shows so the research shows so that's the thing if you look at my uh youtube video i did on fats look under mcdougall and and what is it? Fats, probably. You, you'll you'll see the two major race research articles, or six of them. There's six major research articles that looked at the issue of adding more protein, meat, chicken, fish, beef, or adding uh, uh, supplements in a pill bottle, amino acids or proteins. And all of them show it doesn't work. Now, the studies paid for by the individual manufacturers, that's a little different. 
you know, they're very, very uh, glowing as far as their appraisal goes for their particular product. They're lying. It's called, uh, it's called um, unique positioning. One of the concepts that I want you to learn about is unique positioning. What they do is they take something unique about their product and they advertise it to death, like dairy, calcium, meat, protein, fish, omega-3s. But and that's what they promote in your mind. That's what you're trying to convince you of is that everything's uh, dependent upon these particular, these particular uh, exaggerated qualities of my food. Meat has protein, eggs have protein, dairy has calcium. So I'm going to sell you that. I mean, regardless of the fact that there's never been a case of dietary calcium or protein deficiency, regardless of the fact that all omega-3s are made by plants, we're going to take and promote these supplements. That's just silly. BPH. Benign prostatic hypertrophy. Michael says, are there any new recommendations other than in your previous older newsletters? Uh, well, maybe, maybe. I don't know yet. I have to get some reports from people on using a new device called Zedia. Zedia. There's a, a, a new, uh, what do they call it? Uh, stimulation of the nerves of the, of the leg that are supposed to help with urinary problems. And uh, this is uh, analogous to a TENS machine where you give electrical stimulation to a particular nerve. It's like acupuncture with, with electrodes. And you put this little sock on and you don't have to stab yourself. And uh, it's supposed to work, but I can't attest to it. So there's one study out that was paid for by the Zeta company, which shows it works. But you know how I feel about that. So we'll wait and see. We'll wait and see you know, how more research comes out because this may be extremely helpful. The other things to help with BPH are drink less water, uh, get away from coffee and tea. They're stimulating to the bladder. And um, you could try some of these supplements like salt, ball, metal. I've never found them to be helpful, but give it a try. Pretty safe and cheap. And then there's a bunch of doctor prescribed drugs that likewise don't work well, like Flomax or an anti testosterone drug out there that's supposed to help. That may help, though. Anti testosterone drugs may help, but the, the Flomax is pretty much useless. That's an alpha, alpha adrenergic blocking agent, Flomax. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, then you might want to go on to the surgeries. The surgeries, I start with minimal surgery, which is uh, transurethral re, microwave thermotherapy and laser treatments. And besides that, there seems to be a new treatment for BPH every day because the customer base for BPH is growing leaps and bounds. 60, 70, 80 year old males are becoming the dominant social strata in our society. People are getting old. So what, what do these, uh, uh, these manufacturers do? Is they advertise to the market. The market is old people, middle-aged and old. What kind of problems do old people have? They worry about Alzheimer's. So they sell them a bunch of supplements for dementia, fraud. You know, they sell them uh, sarcopedia drugs, fraud. You know, BPH is also another big topic that everybody's asking about because of the consumer customer base. It's huge. Now, if these younger people were having problems, uh, they probably wouldn't be getting as much attention because they aren't as big of a market share as older people. You know, I think so. So the yeah. problem is, is is getting old and they see what happens to people that get old. Pretty soon they'll be advertising a sock or an herb that will prolong your life by 10 years. I'm going to buy those. You know, when you talked about NAFLD earlier, I don't know if you mentioned this. We actually have a question from Carol, if it could actually be reversed by water fasting. Yes, definitely can be reversed by water fasting. But you just have to lose the weight. The fat that's on your buttocks, the fat in your thighs, the fat in your abdomen is the same fat that's in your liver, the same fat that surrounds your omentum, same fat that's in your double chin. It's all deposited there as just fat. And it causes inflammation in tissues all over the body, in particular the liver. And that's how you get uh, non-alcoholic liver disease. Wow. Yeah. 
here's a question on how you would treat long haul COVID. Sharon's had it for 10 months. I don't know. I sure, you know, this COVID thing is a big deal. I, I have had, these, these are personal thoughts, okay? They're not professional because I'm not an expert on vaccines. So just take what I have to say as personal information and that's it. Not as a doctor or scientist telling you these things. Um, I don't get the flu vaccine because it doesn't work. Now, why doesn't it work? It's because of the genetic drift that takes place every year. That means that the old viruses become anew. And the vaccines were made against the old viruses, not against the new ones. So flu shots basically don't work. And what they tell you is, well, it makes the flu less severe. That's just a, a cop-out. Because they look at the data on death and hospitalizations, they don't see any real benefit. So they start talking about, well, you know, again, a guess, a hunch. They're trying, they say, well, but it probably gets you, it causes you to get less severe COVID. That, that's right. They, they don't know that. Or, or, or influenza, influenza or COVID. But that's the sales pitch they're using now because the data shows it doesn't work, either COVID or, or flu viruses. So how are you going to keep selling these virus, these vaccines to people? If you have any doubt about this being big business, just turn on your TV. You'll see that, you know, two, three, four, five ads an hour are about vaccines these days. This is big business. And the data shows that for COVID, there's, you just read in the paper every day. Don't tell me you don't. A new variant ABB-2, a new variant ABB-5-F. Yeah, every day there's a new variant. And what are you supposed to think? Oh, well, you know, we we, we got this new uh, new vaccine out and uh, let's see, it's been out for two weeks and they're already developing antibodies to the vaccine. You know, how, I mean, how gullible do you have to believe? But I reserve my right to change my opinion on the COVID vaccinations. If they finally get a stable vaccine where they've uh, they found a component of the uh, of the virus that doesn't change so readily. And so the antibodies that are produced uh, end up finding the antigens that they're looking for, the COVID virus. And uh, anyway, so I, I leave I leave the possibility open that both flu and COVID become worthwhile vaccines, but right now they're not. But diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, uh, polio, hepatitis, I mean, all those are, all, my kids and grandkids have all those immunizations. Nice, thank you. I didn't says, Dr. McDougall, I once heard you say that you don't recommend a fruit or a raw diet. Is it because fruits are harmful or they're just not as satisfying as starches? I personally find fruits more delicious than whole grains and legumes, which take more time to make and more difficult to make taste good. Well, you know, the fruit, and you're right about the fruit being less satisfying. Your hunger drive returns much more quickly after eating simple sugars as opposed to complex. In other words, eating uh, refined sugars as opposed to starches. So um, anyway, that's, that's uh, would you read the question again? Yeah, it, she wondered that the reason you don't recommend a raw diet or a fruit diet, is it because uh, fruit is less satisfying or because there's something wrong with the fruit? But that's not why I don't recommend it. Uh, I've never met, except for Steve Jobs, who I never really personally met, I just wrote his. Uh, I just wrote a, about his biography by Isaacson, which, if you haven't seen it, you ought to go see what I did on on uh, on his uh, life story. Steve Jobs. It's in my November 2011 newsletter, and you will find the video where I highly criticize 60 Minutes on what they said about Steve Jobs' death. But anyway. Um, so he was the only fruitarian I'd ever heard about. And I've seen a lot of a lot of people who claim they were fruitarians go through my office because let's face it, I took a, a care of their radical fringe often. But I don't find people follow the kind of diet. I think it's because it's less satisfying. And yes, it is very gratifying to eat a lot of fruit because you like it. It's sugar. You're familiar with it. You can eat 20 fruits in a couple hours. You know, I, I see all that, but the satisfying power doesn't stay with it. There's nothing toxic about it. It's got enough protein. It's got enough vitamins and minerals. 
um, not B12, but it's got enough vitamins and minerals. So uh, all fruit diet nutritionally would be something you could survive on. Uh, I think your triglycerides blood fats would go up a lot. I'm, I'm sure you wouldn't become diabetic on a high fruit diet, at least because of the diet. And uh, as far as a uh, high uh, intake of green and yellow vegetables that are raw, these are people who follow what is advertised as a nutrient dense diet, a green diet. These people are starving because there's not enough calories in these non-starchy green and yellow vegetables. They have rumbling stomachs because of all the vegetable matter that's in their intestinal tract. So anyway, I, I, I'll go ahead. Some people do it though, and they seem to like it, but I would feel very cold oh, if I did I that. I don't think they do it for long though, AJ. I, I think this is a, a temporary tool they use for following a, um, you know, like we recommend the maximum weight loss program, but only as a temporary thing. You know, Mary's Mini has only said she's supposed to do it for two weeks. Mm -hmm. Not because of any danger. It's just that these are tools to allow you to lose weight more efficiently. But it's not the best diet to live for an enjoyable life. You don't want to have to go through those restrictions if they aren't necessary. And this, the most severe of all restrictions would be a uh, diet made of non-starchy green and yellow vegetables like broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower and asparagus. And you'd starve to death. You know, it takes, takes 11 to 22 pounds of cabbage for me to get our cap, my calories in for the day. I don't have that kind of time. Yeah. Start. No, pop, no population that I'm aware of has ever lived on a fruitarian or a, a nutrient-dense diet. Never happened. But I can show you thousands of populations that have lived on starch-based diets. Yes, I can. Yep. Francis says, is it true that if one eats too much fat, their poop floats? And if you eat no fat, your poop sinks. <laughs> well, it stinks. I don't know. I think it's the fiber. I don't think it's the fat. I think it's the amount of fiber. Of course, fiber is only present in plants. So they used to say that if you ate a high fiber diet, your poop would float. But that's when they were recommending high fiber breads. You know, really, really intense fiber contents. And yeah, it would float because you had so much Miller's brand in your diet. Or, and of course, those that didn't have all the fiber, they were more calorie dense and sink. Uh, that's where it comes from. Oh, here's actually a question on low blood pressure. What do you recommend for it? Uh, she yeah. doesn't say what it's it is. What did you say? She says 80s over 50s, which is mine. She says it makes her feel fatigued. She drinks plenty of water. Um, She's been whole food, plant-based, SOS free for 18 months. Maybe eat some salt. This is from Annie. You should try that. Uh, get off the blood pressure pills or any other medication. I don't think she's on them. I think she's just on the diet. Or any other medication that causes blood pressure to go down. Well, lots of medications cause blood pressure to go down, AJ. Uh -huh. you know, it's not just blood pressure. Okay, pressure. I see. Yeah, she doesn't say if she's, she's drinking 125 ounces a day of water or more but she could exercise more consistently. She went from having high blood pressure to having low. Hmm. Well, low blood pressure is never a problem unless you're taking pills, blood pressure pills, or you're bleeding to death or some other major health consequence. Otherwise, the blood pressure cannot become too low in a healthy person. Hmm. Do you know what... I mean, oh, sorry. I'm too low in terms of other people's thoughts, but not in terms of health. You know, uh, people in rural Africa, the, the the folks who lived on the Burkitt kind of diet I talked to you about, they would run blood pressures like uh, 70 over 40 at night. You know, these people have no heart disease, no breast cancer, no colon cancer. You know, they run 12 miles a day. Yep. Uh, this is about, I think it's called POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Can the diet help? reverse it or improve it? I, I don't think so. Again, the first thing I think about is any medication you're taking. Uh, orthostatic hypotension is when you stand up, your blood pressure falls because gravity takes the blood down to your feet. And so you have less blood in the brain. And so you become, become faint or weak. So this happens when you stand up, your blood pressure drops. That's orthostatic hypotension. Uh, eating salt, I haven't found that helps. You can try it. Not going to do you any harm. Uh, I think being careful is what helps. 
I think you need to be extremely careful about standing up and not falling because a fall is a really bad thing. So don't do it. And, um, you know, that, that's, that's the best advice I have. I don't know any, except if you're on many pills, make sure they don't lower blood pressure. You know, sometimes people are taking pills that lower blood pressure that are used instead to treat uh, heart disease or maybe diabetes. Uh, they're, they're used for, you know, they're, they weren't prescribed for you to lower your blood pressure, but they were prescribed, say, to slow the heart rate. Uh, so often you're taking medication that you wouldn't think is blood pressure medication because you really haven't analyzed the effects and side effects, which you should on all your medications. You should be, if you're taking any drugs at all, you should be an expert on these drugs. You should walk into your doctor's office and start talking about your health care. And within five minutes, the doctor should say, sir, ma'am, you know more about these drugs and your disease than I do. Well, you say, of course I do, doc. These are my diseases. These are my pills. Why would you expect me not to know as much as you do as more? So. Yep. Estradiol, 0.01% cream for postmenopausal women. Susan wants to know if you think it's safe. Um, yeah. It, it, for prolapse and pro, she had prolapse. Okay. Well, Are there any non surgical yeah. options to fix prolapse? Yeah, it's not going to fix the prolapse. What fixes the prolapse is either surgery or a pessary, which is a brace, which is put in the vagina, which moves the uterus up. You see, the vagina ends up uh, sticking out, uh, the uterus ends up sticking out of the vagina. It, it sees fresh air, it's not supposed to. Uh, this is due to chronic constipation uh, prolapses. And um, uh, what was the question again, AJ? Uh, yeah. Do you recommend 0.1% estradiol cream? For in, in, chapter, in chapter 13 of my book, The McDougall Program for Women, there's a whole discussion of HRT and how I prescribe it and what doses I use. I think I use 0 0.05 milligrams of estradiol and 20 milligrams of progesterone. But you'll have to look, you know, chapter 13, HRT. It's right there on the page. Great. Um, this is an interesting question from Brenda. Can you please expound upon the science and any personal experiences you've had that certain body types or people with certain metabolisms have a more difficult time losing weight or keeping it off? No, I, I'm not. I've not observed that. <clears throat> I'm not a very bigoted person you know so when it comes to race and color and things like that i i have a i have a hard time i gotta stop and think i'm supposed to be racial and uh anyway or biased against something body type or body color or whatever you know people are basically the same uh realizing that there is some variation that occurs because of genes and because of what you do in your life but i don't think the variation in people is that great now, I don't believe in a blood type diet. Uh, a guy named Didiano, chiropractor from I think Seattle, used to promote this blood type diet. I don't believe in, you know, body size diets. I, you know, I don't see it. You know, why don't I don't see it? It's because when you put everybody on a starch based diet with fruits and vegetables, they get well. I don't have to resort to body types or blood types to explain any discrepancies. They all get well. When I say, well, you know what I mean, okay? You know, the inflammatory processes stop on dietarily caused diseases when you fix the problem. Yep. Aren't you the one that recommended the shoe size diet once? Yeah, I do recommend the shoe size diet. I'm going <laughs> to make a billion dollars selling the shoe size diet. People who have uh, small feet, like your Asians, you know, Japanese, Chinese, they actually have bound the feet of women to make them smaller. Oh, that's really good. That's really good for health is to bind the feet of women. There is a treatment we haven't adopted here in the U.S. medical system. Anyway, small feet, small feet have less heart disease because that's what Asians have is smaller feet. Big feet, which are white Caucasians from Europe, uh, they have more heart disease. So obviously the problem is the shoes and we got to put 
we got to take and, uh, and make sure everybody knows what size shoes they're supposed to wear. Because if you eat a large shoe, shoe size diet, you're going to have to live on mm, half as much food. I don't know. I'm just being silly with you now. That's uh, it, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, it, it's not that hard to understand. Yep. If you heard of celiac artery stenosis, Candace wants to know if your diet can improve or correct it. Celiac, celiac carotid stenosis. Is that what it was? Yeah, that's what they wrote. Celiac artery stenosis. Let me guess what this means. Uh, carotid artery stenosis is like here, I'm trying to figure out where the celiac thing comes in. You know, I just, I, I just can't relate uh, why the celiac is important. It probably is. Yeah, the body, the body, when you correct the cause of atherosclerosis, which is the fat and cholesterol, the Western diet, the arteries heal and they reverse. So it depends on how much of your scar, how much of your your, your blockage is a scar versus active material that can reverse as to how much benefit you get. But regardless, you know, if somebody with atherosclerosis, let's just assume the celiac doesn't matter. Let's just assume we're dealing with any type of atherosclerosis from the penis to the brain. Let's just assume that that's what we're talking about. Then when you stop, when you change the diet, it reverses. Ornish is showing this. Esselstyn is showing this. Blank and Orange showed this. The first person to show it was Walter Kempner back in the 1940s. So yeah, it, it reverses. And there's every reason to believe that the heart arteries reverse at the same rate as the carotid arteries and the penis arteries and the back arteries. And, you know, they're, they're talking about, look, you're talking about 60,000 miles of vessels that the same blood, the same five, six liters of blood are flowing through. Why would you expect it to vary by sight? I mean, all the artery systems have been bathed in unhealthy components of the diet. Not, not just the heart arteries, not just the brain arteries, the arteries in the feet, you know, the arteries in the carotid. It's all going on at the same pace. And you'll find artery disease in other places when you look for, say, a heart attack or a stroke. You know, very commonly, these people have artery disease in the aorta or the femoral arteries or whatever. Why? Because it's the basic underlying disease. Yeah. Redundant colon. Renee says, uh, do you have any advice with somebody with one? I've been whole food plant-based since August 20 of 21. Uh, but I still have occasional slow movements or mild blockages. I also take magnesium supplements to keep things moving. Oh, good. That, that seems to work. The magnesium, and I don't want you to get upset about this or stop taking it, but magnesium is associated with more heart disease. But really, helping with the ball is so much more important than that small fact. Um, so she uh, she takes magnesium, and what, what results has she got? She didn't say. All right. Well, let's start from the beginning again. Well, let me answer it in, in blocks of questions because they get a little complex. What was the first part of her question? I don't even remember now. <laughs> okay. Well, let's All go right. on to the next. Uh, uh, what were we talking about? Was she, was this the redundant colon that we were? Oh, oh yeah, my... floppy colon. Okay, there you go. Thanks. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, Dr. Magnesium, floppy colon, lazy colon. These occur due to chronic constipation, particularly in children. You get a floppy colon or a mega colon. And this is a real, real problem. I mean, these kids, they have a bottle load every month. And in the meantime, they just store off all this feces in the last part of their large intestine and rectum. So you get a bowel instead of being this big, you know, it's like this big. Uh, and as a result, uh, the muscles become very weak because when you contract at a large diameter, the law of Laplace says that you contract at low pressures. You contract at small diameters, you have a great strength, but not at large diameters. And so as a result, you have this weak colon that you fill up and it doesn't empty. So what do you do? Well, you, of course, eat a healthy diet. You know, I'm going to say that. Don't be silly. And then you start training the ball. And you might train the ball with things like... Uh, Seneca, or, you know, all kinds of there are all kinds of uh, pills that you can try for constipation. They sell a, a dozen of them on Amazon. 
anyway, the, the last way and the way that I've only been able to help people with severe megacolon was to train their bowel. And what I would do is see them maybe you know once every couple of weeks and they come in and I give them a dose of lactulose, cronulac, which is a sugar that's not absorbed, which causes the bowel to fill up with water and sugar. So big volume, big volume, and it, uh, it gets big enough so the muscle walls are effective. And then you have bowel movement. And you time by uh, reducing the amount of lactulose, you eventually get off the lactulose and eventually you'll train that bowel and it'll become normal size. Does that happen often? Not that I'm aware of, because uh, I don't think many doctors take the trouble to go through a training process. But if there are doctors dedicated to, and I'd look for one, to a floppy colon or a lazy colon, there's gotta be some doctors out there that put some effort into this. It is so common with children. that I, I would see somebody that has some tricks of the trade. There's, I don't have that many. I just have the food and a little lactose and a little dietary supplement. To, you know, to make fiber in the bottles. So. Um, this question from Linda says, my friend's been whole food plant-based for 25 years and now has cervical cancer. What would you do? Well, it's not a dietary disease. It's caused by an infection with a wart virus. Mm. So, you know, th this is a venereal disease. That's how you catch it. 90% of the cases are caused by the wart virus. And uh, it's a very deadly disease. I've seen several people die of this. Not, not, not pleasant, I'll tell you that. And um, so diet really isn't the cause, nor should it have anything to do with it. But if my files weren't all burnt up, which they are, I would be able to reach into one of the deep, dark bends of my file cabinet and pull out an article that says that taking fruits because of their high levels of uh, citric acid and vitamin C and so on. Uh, fruits, uh, a, high, a diet high in fruit would cause somebody to die less frequently of cervical cancer. Would I put a lot of weight on this one observation? No. I think you gotta assume this is a, a, an infectious disease and eating a good diet. You know, you wanna be healthy regardless of what's going on with you. Yeah. Dr. McDougall, I want to respect your time, which I clearly haven't because oh. it's just that it's so fun. I don't like to say goodbye because it's so fun talking to you. And we've been getting through these questions that have been here. Well, for why, why, don't we get, why don't we get together uh, uh, maybe in a, a couple weeks? I, I know, know. You, know, you know, AJ, I worry that people are getting tired of the redundancy. I don't and they, think they're getting tired of you. I always think they're getting tired of me because I'm here every day. But I, guys, if, are you tired of Dr. McDougall? Put it in the chat. I mean, that you, your retention in three and a half hours is astounding. I don't think well, they are. Not I, yet. I worry, I worry that I'm, I'm testing patient's tolerance to what I'm trying to accomplish, which is to help people get well. I, I'm just afraid that, uh, that I, I, I worry about turning people off. Well, maybe they need to hear it over and over again, you know? No, maybe, maybe they do. But, you know, I think getting together once or twice a month, we'll do that for them. Well, and, when, course, and, and then plus you're so generous every Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific time on Dr. McDougall's YouTube channel. You can ask questions. Heather moderates that. So, yeah. I'll tell you how, I'll tell you how, how we do this. Is what we do is we make this the most popular diet in the world. And then I won't be bored anymore then I won't feel like redundancy because instead of just having 20,000 people who are listening, I could have 330 billion people in the United States listening and, you know, 8 billion worldwide. Yeah. Know, 330 million. Nobody's million. tired of you, Dr. McDougall. And yeah. Daryl Woodruff was the last commenter. He loves when you're Thanks, on. Thanks, Daryl. Thanks, Daryl. Daryl yeah. and I have been together for yeah. 40 years. He's a star yeah. McDougal or he's a good friend of ours. You know, th this isn't, somebody's asking if you can show what you eat, but you do that. If people take the McDougal program every morning, you show a picture of what you ate the day before. Mary shows a, a sample of what we had the night before. I, this, this, this program is really intense, but not in a burdensome way. I mean, we have just one enjoyable educational moment a, after the next. I mean, can you imagine having Doug Lyle and Jeff Novick to entertain you, if you've ever heard them. 
you go, you know, it's it's price, it's worth the price of the ticket just to laugh. So yeah, we work really hard to make this an extremely effective program. And we have a lot of variety in there, you know, lectures and support groups and you know, pretty much everything we could think of to get you to do this. Because our goal is to eventually get a big following. You could agree for a right. I don't know why we shouldn't have the following. You know, I don't know why we shouldn't have more popularity than those who push pills. I know why. It's the money. Because there's the no money in it, right? No, no, no money in you being healthy. You know that because... You stop taking the pills, you stop seeing your doctors, you stop going to the hospital, you stop buying all the supplements. You know, this is not a good business, this Dr. McDougall thing. So, Dr. McDougall, thank you so much. Well, listen, it was a pleasure having to talk to you guys all, all along. I hope I didn't turn too many, too many people off by telling you the difference between addiction and habituation that I see. I know. We're, we're going to make that a best of, actually. We love, yeah, we we love should, that. We should. Yeah, I'm open for I'm open for changing my mind. I really am. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm waiting, for, I'm waiting for the next seizure when somebody gives up peach pie. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm actually gonna be the, the class that you did yesterday. There's a lady that is considered an addiction specialist because she runs an addiction treatment center that I'll be interviewing on Sunday, and she's very okay. kind. She's not going to get into a big fight with you, but I'm going to well, definitely I'm ask you the questions that I ask. Yeah, absolutely. I'm never going to. Anybody, and, you've never and, seen and, anybody have withdrawal symptoms from stopping if, peach pie. If you want, you can be on that. It's a private class. It's not to I you. I don't think it would add to her hour. So let's not do that. Okay, let's not do that then. Uh, All right. Well, thank So we won't see you probably till after Thanksgiving. So we wish you a very happy and delicious okay. holiday. Okay. Well, we're going to put up what we have for Thanksgiving, including the recipe menus. So They'll be on our website. And we have a traditional Thanksgiving, uh, sin turkey. You know, no bird on our table. We have a pumpkin stuffed with bread stuffing instead. No. And otherwise, I, I would invite you over to my meal plan to our dinner, and you would walk away from there and say, that's the best Thanksgiving dinner I ever had, except I missed the turkey. I know that, but you can get over it. Yeah. Well, the turkey will have a much better holiday. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank Thanks, you. Dr. McDougall. Thanks, Mary. And thanks all of you for watching right. another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 for Straight Talk with Dr. Doug Lyle. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.